Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. I grew up out in the wooded country in Illinois, on a short dead end street 10 plus miles from a town, and there were 7 houses in the area spread out on a 2.5 acre wooded lots or larger each. There were no large wild animals, there aren't bears or large animals in the region, and people didn't meander there or show up lost. Actually, lost folks or large animals wandering around never happened in the 20 years I lived there, so please keep that in mind. When I was a young girl in my early teens, I had a good guy friend a few years older than me who lived next door, Terry. Terry was allowed to go out with his friends much later than I was and he would sometimes walk over to my yard after getting home late and throw rocks from the gravel area outside at my window to chat. My bed was right next to the window. I'd open the window and we'd whisper stories and generally talk for a bit. My second story window faced our backyard and his house was to the side. I could see his house from my window over the shrub trees and walking path to his driveway. I'd often know if he was out, the light was on over the side door entrance or already home. Light was off. One time during the summer when my window was open, I heard a car in his driveway dropping him off. I was probably 14 years old and it was around midnight. I heard Terry get out of a car and was talking to his friends. Soon his friends pulled away. I softly called out as loud as I could without waking my parents, asking Terry to stop by and chat. He didn't respond as he probably didn't hear me. Then I came up with a not so brilliant idea to sneak outside and scare him. As kids, we'd often sneak around and scare each other. So I silently sneaked down from the second floor and out my back garage door which led to our backyard below my window which led to Terry's house off the side through our gravel area then through a well-worn path through the woods about 25 feet long. My parents had put in a gravel pit around the back of the house probably because nothing much grew due to the shade of the oak trees. There were 14 inch oak rounds set out as an uneven stepping path in the gravel and if you stepped off of the rounds in the church of gravel slash rocks would give you away. I picked my way expertly and silently across the log rounds facing Terry's house. My eyes got accustomed to the dark and I didn't see him. Also at that time, I heard the door of his house close and the light going off signaling he went in, likely to bed. I waited a bit as I thought I saw something move in the woods between our houses, but not on the path we'd always use. If you didn't use the path, there were wild rose and raspberry plants that had thorns and were painful to walk through if you weren't careful. So I thought it was odd that he'd been in the woods, but maybe he wanted to scare me like I was plotting to do to him. But I saw something human-sized and dark moving through the woods slow and pausing every once in a while like me. It was coming closer and I definitely saw it but it was strange in that it wasn't walking directly to my window to talk. Therefore, I hunched down and waited in silence wondering if I could still startle him. I still thought it was Terry and he saw me sneak out and he was trying to scare me. I watched a dark outline of a human figure moving, but then I would lose sight of it in the foliage. It seemed to be stalking slowly and listening slash checking every few feet while hiding. So I whispered after losing patience one last time for Terry but he didn't answer. I got bored of hiding and crouching, so I quietly tippy-toed back to my garage door and went back inside, silently locking up as I went. I snuck back upstairs to my room above the area where I was just standing slash crouching. My window was open and I definitely heard someone or something walking around the yard. I whispered again for Terry out my window but got no answer. Then I heard someone or something fall and grunt pretty loudly in the window well right below my window. It wasn't enough to wake my parents, but definitely loud enough I didn't mistake it and it sent a shock of fear through me. If you aren't familiar with a window well, it's a semi-circle hole connected to the house dug out for about 3 or 4 feet deep and reinforced with metal. It allows a basement window to be put in below ground level and the hole lets some natural light in. There's no way Terry would have fallen in our window well. We have been playing hide and seek in many outdoor games for years since we were young around the whole neighborhood. We knew everyone's window wells and house footprints, plus pass in the woods like the back of our hands. The grunt sounded humanish and not like an animal. It also pulled itself out quietly without a lot of thrashing. That's when I realized this wasn't a fun game and someone or something was out there and it wasn't Terry. I tried to look outside my window as best as I could but there was a screen on my windows to keep the bugs out so I couldn't lean my head out the window to see next to the wall of our house directly below me. I then heard the crunch of rocks as whatever it was stepping in the noisy gravel. Again, Terry would know where the log rounds were and would not step in the gravel. He knew my parents were pretty strict and he was as good at being quiet 
quiet as I was. Whatever it was stopped and I held my breath. I pretty much sat there with my face pressed against the screen two stories up for probably half an hour. It seemed like an hour but I'm pretty sure I didn't have patience back then to wait that long. I never heard it leave but I grew tired and eventually fell asleep on my bed that was next to the window. There are a few things I'm certain of. It wasn't Terry. I asked him later and he said he went to bed that night when he got home. He also would have no reason to lie. I'm pretty sure it wasn't one of our neighbors and I can't think of any reason a person would be there. We had a few neighbors and only two other houses out of seven had kids. Again, these seven houses were spread out in 2.5 plus acres per home. There weren't any big animals in the area. As wooded as the whole area was, we only had some deer but they were hunted and didn't come close to homes. Plus, our dogs scared them away. When I was 25, there was a short time I was staying at my aunt's. It was her, my two cousins, and I. She lives in a nice apartment complex, and her unit is on the lower level. Her living room has a lot of windows that she keeps open for fresh air and for her cats to people watch. Her unit happens to be on the corner near a grassy courtyard path. When I had first moved in, I noticed a man who gave me an off vibe. My cousins and aunts said he lived upstairs and two units over, recovering from hard drugs that permanently messed him up. His parents paid for him to stay there as they didn't want him with them. They also said other than hearing him mumble and say weird things, no one ever had an issue. My aunt works nights and leaves at 3am. My younger cousin works nights and leaves at 2am. That usually left my same aged cousin and I the only two there until we leave for work around 8. For context, it is a very open living room to dining room plan. My aunt always has people staying over, so she has a second couch in the dining room in place for a table. This is where I slept. She stayed on the one in the living room. My aunt has has also never been one to lock her doors until this incident. One night I'm on my phone trying to sleep at about 1am and hear a man yelling. He's yelling don't shoot and banging on the door to the right of ours. Two male college students live there and just told him he had the wrong apartment and to leave. He says sorry and walks off. I am looking through the kitchen window which is in direct line of sight from my couch bed and it's the weird neighbor who sees me and grins. He then walks back to his home. I was unsettled but not enough to wake anyone else up over it. I told my family nonchalantly that the next day in a lol that was weird way. My cousin and I watch a movie and head off to bed. I have a very hard time staying asleep but I woke up this time to the feeling of someone watching me. I check my phone and it's around 3.30am, so I know it's not my aunt or cousin. I sit up and figure I'll go watch TV on my aunt's couch since she was gone already. The feeling gets stronger as I am in the living room. Then, I see the shadow of a person standing still in the grass courtyard looking in. I froze. I immediately go back to my couch to get my phone. As I do, the person is gone. I am now trying to calm myself down and think of waking my cousin up when I hear the creepy man's voice. He is now at the kitchen window which looks out directly in front of her front door. I drop to the floor out of his line of sight and start frantically trying to call my cousin. The man is now saying things to the window slash front door like, I'm going to hurt you and I'm unarmed over and over again. His face is up against the window. Then he starts talking about wanting to pet the cats he saw through the window. I can't get a hold of my cousin. It's been about 20 minutes of this at this point. In this situation, I didn't have many options. I could jump up and run for a knife, but I need to go to the kitchen. I could try to respond and ask him to leave, but I've learned when you underestimate crazy, you lose every time. I now hear him knocking and knocking while repeating his nonsense. I'm doing that ridiculous looking army crawl snake slither across the floor down the hall now. I see the door handle start to turn. I'm about to jump up when my cousin bursts out of his room directly across from the front door. Now, he's not the biggest guy, but he was intimidatingly mad at the circus show taking place at his front door. He starts yelling at the guy that he needs to get off of his porch and that he's calling the cops. The man man tries to say, I'm unarmed. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't be afraid. My cousin goes off and yells, that's dandy. It's 4am. You need to leave or I'll call the cops. So this guy backs up with his hands in the air and leaves. Needless to say, we didn't go back to sleep. My aunt was called, who called the apartment manager. The next day when I came home from work, his parents were there packing moving boxes in a truck from his place. Maybe he was trying to get me to open the door by seeming friendly. Maybe he had a bad trip and really wanted to pet a cat to feel better. We will never know. This happened over 20 years ago. I was driving back home with my girlfriend at the time. It was Christmas Eve and my mother's family used to hold a large celebration at my aunt's house in Estacada. This was my girlfriend's first time meeting with my extended family, but she got on quite well with them. We spent the majority of the afternoon and evening talking, playing poker, opening presents, and drinking an assortment of adult beverages. My girlfriend had been quite inebriated by the time we had to leave. 
Therefore, I'd be driving us home. It was around 11 p.m. or so. I was driving my girlfriend's car along Highway 211. Now, this stretch of road is surrounded by farms and dense patches of forest, and parts of it are unlit. But nothing to fear. I grew up in this area, so I knew this road like the back of my hand. The both of us were just driving and talking away, just two young lovers making the most of our moment together. There is a portion of the highway that descends down an enormous hill before crossing Deep Creek. Surrounding both sides of the road are thick forests there are no lights. The only thing we could see was the area directly in front of our headlights. I drive down the hill, cross the bridge, and uphill through more forest. It's as the highway starts to flatten out that it happens. Something sprints across the road so suddenly that I almost hit whatever it was. I slam on the brakes. I turn to my girlfriend and ask her if she saw it. She confirmed that she had, but she couldn't make out what it was. Maybe it was a coyote, as they are a fairly common sight in this area. But something felt off about it. Whatever it was, that ran in front of our car disappeared into the woods next to the road. Coyotes don't usually dart out in front of cars, not like that anyway. So for some reason, I decided to check it out. I turned the car around and switched on the high beams to better light up the forest in which this thing had vanished in. I stepped out of the car and walked towards the woods. I don't see anything, but now it feels like perhaps I'd made a grave error. Suddenly, the car's horn blast. It's not a beep 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 that you get if you'd say your driver or passenger wanted you to hurry up and get in the car. No, this was a long blaring beep. I walk back into the car and ask my girlfriend why she leaned on the horn like that. She said nothing, instead she pointed to a spot about 50 feet from where I was standing. I looked over in that direction and that's when I saw it. Surely this was the thing that ran in front of our car. It was a man. He was completely naked, his skin was covered in dirt and mud. He looked back at us and then he smiled and waved to us just before turning around and walking back into the forest. Needless to say, we got out of there. Once we were safely driving again, my girlfriend explained what had just happened. While I was trying to look for whatever was in the area that initially vanished in, he circled back around and came out from another spot in the forest, beyond my car headlights. My girlfriend had seen something out of the corner of her eye, and that's when she saw him. Before she honked the horn, he was walking towards me. We called the authorities once we got safely back home, but they never found anybody. The officer we spoke to assumed the man was probably on drugs. I moved back into the area recently, so I now drive that highway often. No naked man sightings yet, but I can tell you that I'm definitely Definitely extra vigilant now, especially near Deep Creek. This happened like 12 years ago. I was 14 and my sister was 12. It was during summer vacation and we were hanging out just the two of us outside, midday. We lived in a smallish town where during weekdays it was pretty empty because adults were at work. Anyway, we'd been messing around, picking flowers and other random stuff when we decided to cut through a massive field of undeveloped land on the edge of our suburb. It was technically a shortcut to get home, but it wasn't the best idea because it was really bumpy, potted land that other kids and teens left all sorts of stuff laying in. Well, our bad decision came around and bit us. We hadn't made it very far in the field when my sister got two bad things at once. Some sort of twisted metal, maybe an old piece of tool, pierced right through her foam flip-flop and into her foot, and right after it happened she shrieked, jerked, and twisted that ankle on the onion even ground. She started crying and howling and I was worried. The metal hadn't gone too deep and I was able to stop the bleeding with the hem of my shirt, but she couldn't walk anymore obviously. Our parents weren't available, didn't know where we were, and this was before I had a cell phone. My sister was still on the ground crying and I was trying to calm her down, when something made me feel like looking up. Y'all, it was the feeling of being watched. Out of the field, across the road, standing on the corner in the distance was some random guy watching us. He was too far away for me to see him clearly. All I could tell for sure was that he was blonde, probably adult, and dressed too warmly for July. He was all alone, stock still, just staring at us. I looked back at my sister and basically said to get on my back, I was carrying her home. We were leaving right now. Now, I had to carefully pick my way through this stupid field of my own bad flip-flops, with my crying sister on my back. Luckily, she was tiny, but I was no linebacker either. It had rained a day ago, and the field had puddles of water in the low spots. We were both kind of wet, from her falling when she got hurt. I swiveled back to check if he was still watching us, and he was. Not only was he watching us, but he'd crossed the road and entered the field. Now he was standing stock still again and just watching. Ice in the veins doesn't describe it. One of the scariest moments of my life up to that point. My sister looked when I looked, saw my face, and started crying even harder. I just shook her a bit on my back and 
whispered something like, stop it. I need to concentrate on getting us home. Watch him and tell me if he starts following again. Just be quiet. So that's what we did. I started walking again as fast as I could without getting hurt. My sister watched him while I carried her. After less than a minute, she whispered to me that he was following again. How fast? Just walking. Is he watching us? Yes. I told her to tell me if anything changed and kept going. I stomped through puddles and I couldn't see into when I had to, hoping there was nothing sharp in them. I lost a flip-flop in the mud and just kept going. We were about three-fourths of the way through the massive field when my sister whispered that I least wanted to hear. He was speeding up. I turned us right around, so we were facing him head on, and as loud as I could, I yelled something like, Hey, we see you. Leave us alone. I'll call the cops. Nothing. He'd stop again when I stopped, but gave no sign whatsoever he'd heard me. Just nothing. I turned us around again and kept going. My poor little sister was shaking like a leaf and just saying my name over and over again. It was awful, and there was nothing I could do but keep going. Eventually, he started following again, at a slow pace. I finally made it into our suburb, out of the muddy field and onto solid concrete told my sister to hold on as tight as she could and booked it. Started running with her on my back as fast as I could. We couldn't see him anymore. Didn't know what he was doing or where he was. Every muscle hurt from carrying her so far. My bare foot was all scratched up from the road, but I didn't stop. I kept moving. With my sister looking out behind us, it felt like my heart was going to explode. After what felt like forever, I made it to our house. Ran across the yard, up the drive, put down my sister, who started crying again. My hands were shaking so badly I could barely use my key. We made it in safely and called my mom. She had us lock every door and window and came rushing home. But nothing happened after that. He never found us, so we never saw him again. So a few years ago, I, a 17-year-old female at the time, would attend community college at the outskirts of my hometown. I would take an hour and a half long bus drive because both of my parents worked and my other siblings were too young to drive. The outskirts of my town, despite being the literal outskirts, are more populated than you expect, with strip malls and apartment buildings. The bus would drop me off about four blocks from my university, which isn't too far. I always enjoyed those few minutes. Anyway, this one time, I left my phone at the library. Using my brother's phone, I called a friend who worked at the school library during the late evening shift, 7 to 9, and he'd said he'd bring my phone to me. But he lived closer to the college than I did, so I told him I'd just meet him at his shift and pick it up myself. He said, okay, and I boarded the bus at around 6. Now, I get off the bus at my usual spot and the place looked deserted. I'd never been there that late at night and maybe it was because it was a weekday that people were home or I don't know. I had my brother's phone in my pocket and just clutched it tighter and tighter picking up my speed until I was practically jogging. I'm nearing to a corner when a flash of light goes off to my right. There, in the shadows, is a sleazy looking man. He's balding with a tourist shirt unbuttoned halfway. He was wearing sunglasses at night and was wearing some gold jewelry. And most importantly, he had just taken a picture of me. In the instant that I saw the flash go off, I knew it was coming from his phone. Now, I think it's important to understand our positioning. He was pressed against a building to my right, right at the corner I had turned. I was about 10 feet away from him. To my left, on the same side of the street, was a car with blacked out windows and no license plates, directly across the sidewalk from the man. The car was parked with the driver's seat facing me, so that it was on the wrong side of the road, because America drives on the right side as opposed to the left. I had slowed down at that point as I began to debate my next move, cross the street and continue walking, make a break for the school, turn 180 and leave my phone at the library, or approach the potentially dangerous man. I did the stupidest thing possible and approached the man. Anyway, I I demanded to know what he was doing. He looked taken aback. I could see his brain short-circuiting because I was demanding to know what he was doing. He eventually sputtered about how he was just standing here. I said, no, I saw you take that picture of me. His face fell. He started saying no, he hadn't done that. Why would he want a picture of me? I had imagined it. I asked to see his gallery, which is extremely risky because who knows what I could have seen. He slowly pulls up his gallery and as it's opening, I see a blurry picture of me in the distance. I didn't think I'd get that far. Granted, I had been running on adrenaline during our whole interaction, but this really made me pause. I told him to delete it. Then a door slammed shut. I just knew it was the parked car. My brain cleared up and I hightailed it to the school. I could hear a single pair of footsteps behind me, but I sure wasn't going to turn around and check who it was. The car started, but they would have to have to do a U-turn on a relatively narrow street just to be able to follow me. I think that's what saved my life, the fact that the car was parked facing the wrong direction. I reached the school out of breath and in tears. My friend opened the building for me and I explained what had happened. He locked us in while he called the police and we waited for them, but the sleazy guy and his buddy were never found. Anyway, my mom had gotten out of work by that point and I called her to ask to pick me up. 
We waited with my friend till the end of his shift and drove him home too. Needless to say, I carry a mace with me everywhere I go now and I'm yet to find a police report stating a guy matching his description had been arrested. To be honest, I don't think the police believed me fully, but who knows. I'm a single male, 33 years old, who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is not what you would call a nice building. I'm on a road close to Colfax Avenue, which if you're familiar with, the geography of this area is not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I wouldn't consider this an up-and-coming neighborhood. This evening, I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I had watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood making it hard to sleep. So this night I decided to watch a stand-up special instead, keep it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I have classes early the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I lay and didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout my apartment. I remember dozing off around 11 o'clock. It was effortless, which meant I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either end creating a tucked in feeling. And all of a sudden, I'm not sleeping anymore. I'm woken up by a knock at my door. Then a man's voice says maintenance. I just sat there, sitting bolt upright on my couch. I knew something was off. I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15 a.m. I didn't move. The floors of my apartment are old wood, and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever was knocking to know someone was at home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up and ran over to the door as they normally would, but but I stayed still and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and closed. I have one window where I have a partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and race over to it. I saw an old looking green SUV sitting in the no parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got in the car and it drove off. I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place as you would need a key to do so. I don't know what his intentions were, but no one knocks on someone's door at 2.15am claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind. So I'm a 23 year old female. I live in a townhouse with my two children, two and six months old. My fiance did live with us until two weeks ago when I caught him trying to have relationships with other women and made him move out. That's important to the story. I'm a stay at home mom and when he did live with us, my ex worked evenings. Let me set the scene. We live in a tiny house in northern Pennsylvania. My line of townhouses sits in front of a big field that runs to a line of woods. As far as I'm aware, these woods stretch out for at least a few miles and I'm not aware of any houses in there or any roads that lead through them. My living room has three windows that look to the field and my bedroom on the second floor only has one window that faces that way as well. People do tend to walk their dogs back in the field and kids sometimes play back there, but I rarely ever see anyone close to my house. For that reason, I tend to leave my blinds and curtains open because I guess I just enjoy the view. So in July of 2019, I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep. All the lights were off, but I had my window and blinds open since it was so warm. I was looking out the window and I noticed small red and white lights just outside. I got up and looked to realize that the lights were coming from a drone. I ran downstairs to where my fiance at the time was sitting in the living room and ran to the window. I told him what I saw but of course when he went to look it was gone. I was paranoid that the drone could have had a camera on it and someone was watching me with it. I kept my blinds closed for a while after that. Fast forward to January of this year. I guess I stupidly got comfortable and assumed that whoever it was flying the drone was a one time creep. My blinds were open and I had just gotten out of the shower. I was sitting on my bed pretty much naked except for my underwear, scrolling on my phone when out of the corner of my eye I saw lights again out of the dark window. It was that drone again. I ran out of the room and waited for a few minutes. I peeked back into my room and it was gone. I quickly shut my blinds and got dressed. Honestly, I felt sick at how stupid I was to leave my window open again, especially when I was practically naked. Now for the real disturbing part. My two-year-old son and I were out in the field two weeks ago, three days after I kicked 
kicked out my boyfriend playing ball. I had my six month old strapped to me in a baby carrier. Probably about a half hour after we had been out there, I heard a slight worrying noise coming towards us. I looked up and saw the drone flying towards us. I looked around and didn't see anyone. It stopped right over us. I freaked and grabbed my son and dragged him into the house, looking back at the tree line every so often as we went. I knew they had to be hiding in there. I went inside, closed the blinds, and called my mom and told her about the situation. She told me just to keep an eye out. I said I would. My son likes to line his toys up against the window, so I figured it wouldn't hurt to open them up just an inch or so. A little while later, after we ate dinner and it was almost dark, I was feeding my six month old and my son was playing. He was standing over by the window, lining up his toys. He started saying, Dada, Dada. I assumed he was just missing his father and dismissed him by saying he was going to see him that weekend. He kept saying, Dada, Dada, though. I looked up and saw him pointing to the window under the little gap the blinds didn't cover. I froze. I remember that he calls any man with facial hair Dada because it reminds him of his father, but there was no way someone would be bold enough to actually come up to my window. Not when my neighbors are literally right there. Anyone could see them, but there aren't any lights back there, so unless someone actually stepped out of their house, I guess nobody would see them. Maybe it was my ex, but he should be at work at that time. I ran to the window and moved my son. I didn't want to lift the blinds, but honestly, I was sure it had to be the person who had been creeping on me for the past year and I wanted to see who it was. I pushed the blinds up and was looking at a man who I definitely had never seen before, crouching in front of me. He was bald with a mustache and goatee. I have no idea how old he was. He could have been anywhere from 30 to 50. When he saw me, he smiled and stood up. I yelled and told him to screw off and that I was going to call the cops. He just stood there, smiling at me like some freak. I was about to close the blinds again when he said something I couldn't hear. I told him to leave again and he said, louder this time, I just want to talk to you. I shook my head no and yelled the same thing to him. He started slapping his hands on the window, yelling no, 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 over and over. I grabbed my phone, scared he was going to try to break in. I dialed 911. My kids were crying from the yelling and I felt on the verge of tears. I told the operator what was going on. The whole time I was on the phone, the man was pounding on my window, screaming now. He was yelling all kinds of nonsense and I only caught some of it. He said he's been watching me for months. I'm beautiful. He wants to come with them. He'll kill my children if I don't. The operator told me to go into an upstairs room and hide until the police arrive. My town doesn't have a police department, so we rely on the state police. She said it would be about 20 minutes, but to stay on the phone with her. The man was practically punching my window now and was just screaming like a maniac. I was about to grab my kids and run upstairs when I heard someone else screaming. The man bolted. I looked out and saw my neighbor and his girlfriend. I opened the window and my neighbor said that he heard the man so he ran around the building. He said when the guy heard him, he ran back to the woods and disappeared in the tree line. They said they also called the police. I thanked them a hundred times. The police arrived 10 minutes later. They did a quick search around the buildings and found the man and arrested him. I don't know why that guy targeted me or why he waited so long to do something. I'm just happy my neighbors were there to intervene or who knows what would have happened. I was about 7 years old, my brother about 10. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just us three at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left puts you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room which was also across the hall from our upstairs bathroom. At either end of the hallway are window doors we always kept locked locked and rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard and the door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leans into a small hill. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was always a light sleeper and they just couldn't help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back towards the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed. The past few nights have been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me or if she was already half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I on the other hand was terrified by it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows is the reason I started running from the stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later when I was about 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories 
about Max's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors when my mom blurted out, Do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise because in all the years I lived in that house, we never once called the cops, gun owner family in a quiet rural West Virginia neighborhood, etc. I asked her what she was talking about and she looked equally surprised as if she had just revealed something by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. One night, I woke up hearing noises outside my window and when I looked, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how turning on the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up, tall white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans, short dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. It turns out he had escaped from jail on a murder charge. Now, I know it sounds so obvious hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until a few years ago in my mid-twenties that I pieced together that my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who spent multiple nights casing our home. At the time, I just turned 17 and was still pretty naive. I live in England, so it is legal to work in a bar and serve alcohol supervised, but not to drink alcohol. Not that it stopped me. I worked in a working men's club filled with middle-aged elderly people. Most were really nice. I sold bingo tickets twice for a week for my dad's cousin and I was pretty good at it. It's not typical to get tips here, but I earned more in tips than I did my actual wage. On a Saturday, my dad would come with me to have a drink with my elder sister while they played competitive darts in the main bar overlooking my booth. This one particular night, there was a middle-aged average looking guy. A little on the plump side, but generally unnoticeable. On the first round of selling tickets, he was at the fruit machine opposite the entire time, looking over at me occasionally. The second round, he approached me, asked me what I was selling, how bingo worked, etc. Clearly had never played before, but hey, everyone starts somewhere, right? He bought some tickets and offered to buy me a drink. I declined and informed him I was underage. By now, I had a bit of an uneasy vibe and didn't want to take a drink from a guy I don't know. He then offered a cola complimenting me a little too hard. Again declined and went on my way to help with the game in the main hall. Part of my job. Third time, he stood against the wall adjacent to me and just watched me work. He'd waited until the queue calmed down and bragged about how much money he had and now he wants to be my sugar dad. How cute I am commenting on my figure. I was trapped in my booth. I was late into the main hall so the concert chairman, guy who calls out the bingo numbers and gives out winnings, comes out and asks what was going on. This guy claims we were just talking. I apologized to the chairman and he walked me to the hall. Said he could see I was freaked out so I told him everything. He made the bar staff aware who also made my boss, my dad's cousin, aware also. Last round of selling tickets, he doesn't even wait for me to get back in my booth. He grabs my butt, telling me how he wants to be my sugar dad once again. Tries to push me against the wall and is suddenly span around. Not just by my dad but my boss and numerous staff members and customers who heard and saw what went down. He started arguing his innocence until my dad not so politely introduced himself. He knew he was screwed. My dad punched him in the nose, blood running down his face. Everyone picked him up like a plank of wood and threw him out the closed door. Never saw him after that. Everyone checked up on me to make sure I was okay. My sister covered the rest of the shift and I had a free bar tab for two months. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. It was a chilly autumn evening when I returned home from work. The setting sun painted the sky with hues of orange and pink, casting long shadows on the quiet suburban streets. As I pulled into my driveway, a sense of relief washed over me. I was eager to unwind, cozy up with a book, and forget about the stresses of the day. I lived alone in a small, single-story house on the outskirts of town. The neighborhood was peaceful, and I had always felt safe there. But little did I know that my peaceful life was about to take a chilling turn. It all started with a simple knock on my front door. I didn't think much of it. It wasn't uncommon for a neighbor or delivery person to stop by. However, when I opened the door, my eyes met those of a complete stranger. He was a tall, weary man with unkept hair and a scruffy beard. His clothes were worn and dirty, and his gaze was unsettlingly intense. Hi there, he said, his voice a little too eager. I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm new to the area, and my car broke down a few streets over. Could I use your phone to call for a tow? His story sounded plausible, but something about his demeanor made me feel 
feel uneasy. I hesitated for a moment before offering to make the call for him instead. He seemed grateful and handed me a scrap of paper with a number scrawled on it. As I dialed, he hovered uncomfortably close, making me anxious. A voice on the other end of the line confirmed that a tow truck was on its way. I informed the man and he thanked me profusely, promising to repay me the favor someday. I didn't think much of it and politely bid him farewell. Over the next few weeks, the stranger's visits became frequent. He would drop by unannounced, often with a different excuse each time. Sometimes he claimed he needed directions, and other times he said he was looking for a lost pet. Each time, I became more suspicious of his intentions, but I didn't want to escalate the situation. Then one night, as I was preparing dinner in my kitchen, I noticed movement outside of my window. Peering through the curtains, I saw the man standing in my backyard, watching me intently. My heart pounded and I quickly turned off the lights, hoping he would think I wasn't home. I considered calling the police, but worried that it might make him more aggressive. The visits continued and I grew increasingly uneasy. I started locking all of my doors and windows, even during the day. I confided in a few close friends about the situation, and they urged me to contact the authorities, but I was hesitant, fearing it might provoke the man further. One afternoon, as I was leaving for work, I spotted him waiting near my car. My heart sank and I immediately retreated back into my house, trying to remain as inconspicuous as possible. After a few minutes, I carefully peeked outside, relieved to find him gone. Enough was enough. I contacted I contacted the local police and explained the situation. They assured me they would keep an eye on the area and advised me to report any further incidents. I felt a bit safer knowing that they were aware of the situation. Months passed and life gradually returned to a sense of normalcy. The persistent visitor had vanished from my life, leaving me with a mix of relief and lingering apprehension. I began to let my guard down, hoping that he had truly moved on and that my days of fear were behind me. But as winter approached, so did an unsettling change in the atmosphere. One evening, while I was engrossed in a movie, I heard a faint tapping sound at my window. My heart raced as I cautiously approached the source of the noise. As I drew the curtains aside, I found myself face to face with a chilling sight. A message etched into the frost of the glass that read, Missed you. Fear gripped me like a vice, and I immediately called the police, showing them the eerie message. They took it seriously and conducted a thorough investigation, but without any leads or concrete evidence, there was little they could do. The visits intensified once again. The man seemed to know my schedule, always choosing moments when I was alone to make his presence known. He would leave unsettling notes on my doorstep, scrawled on random pieces of paper or even on torn out pages from my own books. Each message was cryptic, like twisted riddles meant to unsettle my mind. With the police unable to catch him in the act, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I installed motion activated lights around my property and placed security cameras in every corner, hoping to catch a glimpse of him or any clue that could identify him. One bitterly cold night, I awoke to the sound of shuffling outside my bedroom window. My heart pounded in my chest as I summoned the courage to investigate. Peering through the curtains, I saw the man trying to pry open a window. Panic surged through me and I called the police immediately. The dispatch operator kept me on the line as I hid in my closet, anxiously waiting for the police to arrive. The minutes felt like hours as I clutched my phone, praying for help to come in time. When the sirens finally echoed through the silent night, I let out a breath I hadn't realized I was holding. The police caught the man red-handed, attempting to break into my home. He was arrested and as they led him away, I saw the same intense gaze in his eyes. But it was mixed with a disturbing grin. The officers assured me that he wouldn't be causing me any more trouble, but I couldn't shake the feeling that the ordeal wasn't truly over. The court proceedings were a stressful and harrowing experience. The man was charged with stalking, attempted burglary, and harassment, among other offenses. His defense lawyer tried to portray him as mentally unstable, but the evidence stacked against him was overwhelming. Finally, he was sentenced to a lengthy prison term, with a restraining order in place to keep him away from me. The years passed and the fear that had once gripped me began to wane. I moved moved to a different town, started fresh, and gradually rebuilt my life. The memories of that terrifying period became like distant nightmares, fading with time. But as I share this story with you now, I can't help but glance over my shoulder occasionally, a lingering instinct born from the haunting experiences of the past. And so, I implore you to stay vigilant, for even in the most ordinary places, there may be shadows waiting to disturb your peace. It was a stormy evening, rain pounding relentlessly on my car's windshield as I drove down a deserted highway. The dim glow of streetlights illuminated the road ahead, casting eerie shadows on the surrounding trees. I was eager to get home after a long day of traveling, but the weather seemed determined to keep me from reaching my destination. As I pressed on, my eyes caught a figure huddled by the roadside, drenched in holding out a thumb, a hitchhiker. My heart wavered between empathy and caution. It was late, and picking up a stranger in this weather was risky, but I couldn't ignore the 
of guilt tugging at me, against my better judgment, I decided to pull over. The moment he climbed into my car, I noticed something unsettling about the hitchhiker. His clothes were worn and his face bore the wariness of a thousand miles. He looked much older than I had initially thought, with a scruffy beard and sunken eyes. His name was Jack, he said, and he was grateful for the ride. Jack didn't seem dangerous, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. He spoke with an air of sadness, hinting at a troubled past and recent hardships. I listened, offering a few words of comfort as we continued down the highway. As the rain intensified, visibility dwindled, and I focused intently on the road. I tried to keep the conversation going to stave off any awkwardness. However, Jack's responses grew increasingly vague, and he seemed preoccupied with something else entirely. I really appreciate you giving me a lift, he finally said, breaking the silence. I've been stranded for hours, and it's been tough to find someone willing to help. It's no problem, I replied. Where are you headed? He hesitated for a moment before replying, I don't really have a destination in mind, just trying to put some distance between me and the past, you know? I nodded sympathetically, but a twinge of unease crawled up my spine. It was as though he was trying to avoid any specific details about his journey. My instincts urged me to stay vigilant, reminding me that trusting a stranger in the dark of night might not be the wisest decision. As we drove further, I noticed Jack glancing at my belongings in the backseat and even craning his neck to look at my GPS. It made me uneasy, as if he was sizing me up or planning something. I decided to divert his attention away from my personal items and steer the conversation toward more general topics. An exit sign came into view and I saw the perfect opportunity to end the ride. Hey, this is my exit, I said, my voice feigning casualness. I hope this spot works for you. But Jack's reaction was unexpected. His eyes widened and he looked genuinely alarmed. No, no, please, just a little farther, he pleaded. I promise I won't be any trouble. My heart pounded as I weighed my options. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously amiss. However, I didn't want to put myself in any unnecessary danger. I decided to trust my gut and firmly insisted that I had to stop at that exit. Reluctantly, Jack agreed and as I pulled over, he quickly thanked me and stepped out of the car. As I drove away, I glanced at my rearview mirror and to my surprise, I saw him standing in the rain, watching my car until it disappeared from sight. In the days that followed, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that lingered after encountering the mysterious hitchhiker named Jack. I kept replaying the encounter in my mind, wondering what might have happened if I had ignored my instincts and continued driving with him. My unease grew when I realized that I hadn't taken proper precautions when offering him a ride. I scolded myself for not considering the potential risk of picking up a stranger, especially on a stormy night when visibility was poor. Determined to learn from the experience, I decided to be more cautious and prepared in the future. I researched safe practices for offering help to strangers, especially while driving alone. It became clear that while compassion is important, safety should never be compromised. Weeks passed and the memory of the encounter with Jack began to fade, buried under the weight of daily routines and responsibilities. But just when I thought I had put the incident behind me, a news report caught my attention. The local news featured a segment on a man named Jack Harrison, who had been involved in a series of violent crimes across neighboring states. My heart pounded as they showed his picture, confirming my worst fears. It was the same hitchhiker I had encountered that stormy night. According to the report, Jack had been arrested after leading the police in a high-speed chase, during which he injured several officers and caused a serious accident. The authorities had been searching for him for months, and he had a lengthy criminal history, including charges for assault, robbery, and even kidnapping. My hands trembled as I realized just how close I had come to danger. It sent shivers down my spine, knowing that I had unwittingly given a ride to a dangerous criminal. I couldn't help but think about the possible outcomes if I hadn't decided to trust my instincts and let him out of my car. The experience left a profound impact on me. I realized that we often encounter situations that demand a balance between compassion and caution. While I had wanted to help the hitchhiker, I had failed to prioritize my safety. From that moment on, I vowed to be more vigilant and aware of my potential risk when dealing with strangers, no matter how genuine they may seen. The news of Jack's arrest also led me to reevaluate my trust in others. Not everyone we meet has good intentions and it's essential to stay vigilant and prioritize personal safety. I made a conscious effort to share my story with family and friends, hoping that my experience would serve as a cautionary tale and remind others to be wary in similar situations. As time passed, I carried the lesson with me, growing stronger in my resolve to prioritize safety while remaining compassionate. The encounter with Jack had been a terrifying wake-up call, but it also served as a valuable reminder that in a world where we often aim to help others, we must first ensure our own well-being. 
A few years back, I found myself in a small town for a weekend getaway. My friends and I had rented a cozy cabin near a picturesque forest. We were excited to explore the area, take long hikes, and immerse ourselves in nature's beauty. One afternoon, we decided to venture deeper into the woods, following a winding trail that led us to an abandoned building. It stood like a forgotten relic, its walls covered in graffiti, and its windows broken. Curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to investigate the eerie structure. As we stepped inside, the air was thick with dust and a sense of isolation. My heart raced, but the adrenaline rush added to the excitement. We wandered through the decrepit rooms, taking photos and speculating about the building's history. Time seemed to fly, and we lost track of how far we had ventured into the decaying structure. That's when I noticed something odd, a faint sound echoing from the distance. It was a barely audible shuffle, like footsteps on a creaky floorboard. I paused, holding my breath to see if my friends have noticed it too, but they seemed oblivious, captivated by the sights around them. Unnerved but not wanting to spoil the fun, I decided to brush off the sound as my imagination playing tricks on me. We continued exploring, but the atmosphere had changed. A feeling of unease gnawed at me, and I kept glancing over my shoulder, sensing that something was amiss. As we ventured deeper into the building, the shuffling sound grew louder. My unease turned into genuine fear, and I couldn't ignore the nagging voice inside my head warning me that we were not alone. I decided to voice my concerns to my friends, hoping they would take me seriously. Just as I was about to speak up, a chilling realization hit me. I could no longer hear my friends' voices. Panic surged through me as I turned around, only to find myself standing alone in a dimly lit hallway. The shuffling sound was now unmistakable and much closer. Guys, I called out, my voice trembling, where are you? No response. I felt a knot forming in my stomach as I tried to find my way back to the entrance. The building seemed to have transformed into a maze, with each hallway leading to another dead end. My heart pounded in my chest, and every shadow seemed to be concealing something sinister. Then, from the corner of my eye, I caught a glimpse of movement. I turned, half expecting to see my friends, but my blood ran cold when I saw a figure lurking in the shadows. It was a man, dressed in tattered clothes, his eyes fixed on me. Fear paralyzed me as I tried to make sense of the situation. How had he gotten in here without us noticing? What were his intentions? I was too far from the entrance, and escape seemed impossible. Hey, he called out, his voice unnervingly calm. Don't be afraid, I'm just exploring, like you. His words did little to comfort me. I knew I needed to find my friends and get out of there, but the man blocked my path, making me feel trapped and vulnerable. Summoning all the courage I had left, I decided to make a dash for it. I turned and ran back the way I came, hoping to find my friends and escape together. The man's footsteps echoed behind me and I pushed myself to run faster. As I turned a corner, I saw a glimpse of daylight, the entrance. Relief washed over me as I burst out of the building, gasping for breath. My friends were waiting outside, concerned looks on their faces. What happened? Where were you? They asked. I tried to catch my breath before explaining the encounter with a the stranger. They were alarmed and immediately agreed to leave the abandoned building. We hiked back to the cabin, our hearts still pounding from the ordeal. The incident left a lasting mark on us, reminding us to be cautious even in seemingly harmless explorations. The rest of our weekend retreat was overshadowed by the encounter at the abandoned building. We tried our best to enjoy our time, but the fear lingered, and the once exciting hikes became tinged with trepidation. Back at home, I couldn't shake the feeling that the stranger had followed us, even though there was no concrete evidence to support it. Every little noise at night seemed amplified, and I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see his face in the shadows. I confided in my friends about my fears, but they reassured me that it was likely just my mind playing tricks on me, haunted by the unsettling experience. They reminded me that the stranger had not followed us back, and that he was probably just a curious individual who happened to be exploring the same abandoned building. I wanted to believe them, but the fear persisted. I started locking all doors and windows, double checking everything before going to bed, and installing security cameras around my home. I felt like a prisoner in my own house, always on edge, unable to fully relax. Days turned into weeks and the encounter with a stranger remained etched into memory. I tried to move on to regain the sense of security I once had, but the events of that day had forever changed me. Then one evening, while watching the local news, my heart skipped a beat. The reporter mentioned a string of unsettling incidents involving a man who had been approaching hikers and campers in the area. The description matched that of the stranger I encountered in the abandoned building. As I listened to the news report, the memories flooded back. The eerie shuffling sounds, the chilling encounter, and the fear that gripped me. I realized that my instincts had been right all along, and my friends and I had narrowly escaped a dangerous situation. The authorities were urging anyone with information or similar experiences to come forward. Without hesitation, I contacted the police and shared my account of the encounter. They took my statement seriously and assured me that they would investigate. In the following weeks, the police increased patrols in the area and launched an active search for the man. They warned hikers and campers to be cautious and report any suspicious activity. I felt a sense of relief knowing that the authorities were taking the situation seriously 
seriously. Months passed and there was no sign of the stranger. The anxiety that had consumed me gradually lessened, but the experience remained a haunting reminder of the importance of trusting our instincts and being vigilant. To this day, I still think about that encounter and the chilling possibility of what might have happened had I not managed to escape. It's a lesson that will stay with me forever. The world can be a beautiful place, but it can also be filled with hidden danger. It was the summer of 2023, and I was on a road trip across the country, exploring new places and making memories. As dusk settled in, I found myself in a small, desolate town that seemed stuck in time. The sun dipped below the horizon, and I realized it was time to find a place to rest for the night. Driving along the deserted highway, my eyes caught sight of an old, run-down gas station. Its flickering sign hinted at life, but it appeared deserted for years. Desperation overtook my better judgment, and I decided to give it a shot. After all, it was the only sign of civilization for miles around. I parked my car and cautiously approached the station. The creaking sound of the rusted door sent shivers down my spine. I stepped inside, and the musty scent of decay greeted me. The interior was dimly lit, with cobwebs covering every corner. Broken shelves and shattered glass littered the floor, remnants of the place that once thrived. An unsettling feeling washed over me, but I convinced myself that it was just my imagination playing tricks. I called out, Hello, is anyone here? My voice echoed through the silence, but there was no response. As I made my way toward the counter, I noticed a flickery light coming from a back room. Curiosity got the better of me, and against my instincts, I approached the source of the light. The door was slightly ajar, and peering inside, I saw a shadowy figure hunched over something. Hey, is everything okay? I asked hesitantly. The figure suddenly stopped moving and turned its head slowly to face me. It was a man, but his appearance was unsettling. His eyes were wide and vacant, and a crooked smile stretched across his face. He didn't respond, but rather continued to stare at me in an eerie silence. Feeling a rush of anxiety, I backed away slowly, my heart pounding in my chest. Without uttering a word, I retreated to the front of the gas station. I decided it was time to leave, but as I turned to exit, the man suddenly appeared in the doorway, blocking my path. Panic set in, and I fumbled for my car keys. He stood there, still grinning like a malevolent specter. My mind raced with fear, imagining the worst scenarios. I managed to keep my voice steady as I spoke. I'm leaving now. I don't want any trouble. His grid widened, sending chills down my spine. You can't leave, he murmured, his voice sending shivers through the air. Nobody ever leaves this place. I could feel his words like an icy grip on my soul, but I couldn't let myself succumb to the terror. Summoning all the courage I had, I made a run for it, pushing past the man and sprinting to my car. I could hear his unnervy laughter echoing behind me as I drove away, adrenaline coursing through my veins. Over the following days, my road trip took on a more cautious and vigilant tone, and every time I passed an abandoned building or a desolate area, the memory of the eerie gas station would resurface, sending shivers down my spine. It was as if the encounter had left an indelible mark on my psyche, a constant reminder of the inexplicable and the dangers that might lie in the unknown. As I drove through various towns and landscapes, I couldn't help but wonder if there was something deeper and darker beneath the surface of these seemingly ordinary places. I kept my eyes peeled for any signs of unusual activity or anything that might indicate a connection to the enigmatic gas station. However, I found nothing concrete, just my own unease. With time, the memory of that fateful night began to fade slightly, but I couldn't forget the haunting stare of the man I encountered or the bone-chilly feeling of being trapped in that forsaken gas station. The incident played like a broken record in my mind, and I found myself delving into research during my travels, seeking any clues or urban legends that might might explain what I had experienced. Through online forums and local stories, I stumbled upon a handful of tales that eerily mirrored my own encounter. Whispers of a wandering gas station began to surface, a place said to appear when and where you least expected it. According to these accounts, the station was a portal to an otherworldly realm, where time and reality twisted in inexplicable ways. These stories were both intriguing and terrifying, but they felt more like campfire tales than reality. Still, the coincidences were hard to ignore. People spoke of unsettling encounters with the station's mysterious occupants, describing them as otherworldly beings who seemed to be stuck in a time loop, reliving the same moments over and over again. Determined to find some answers, I decided to revisit the town where I encountered the gas station. This time, I was prepared, equipped with a camera, a voice recorder, and a journal to document any strange occurrences. As I approached the area, an eerie silence enveloped me, making my heart race in anticipation. The town looked just as desolate as before, but the gas station was nowhere to be found. Its absence only deepened the mystery. I began to interview locals, discreetly inquiring about the abandoned station and the strange occurrences in the area. Most people dismissed my questions as idle curiosity, but a few shared cryptic stories that only fueled my intrigue. One elderly man, who appeared to be hesitant to speak, eventually shared a chilling tale. He recounted a legend that
that had been passed down through generations in the town, speaking of an ancient curse that bound the land to a realm of restless spirits. According to the story, the gas station was a nexus, a thin veil between our world and the ethereal plane, where lost souls wandered aimlessly. As the day turned to dusk, I decided to spend the night in the town, hoping to witness anything out of the ordinary. I parked my car near the area where the gas station had once stood and set up my equipment. The hours crept by slowly, and my mind began to play tricks on me as I imagined shadows moving in the darkness. Just as I was considering giving up, a faint, ethereal glow appeared in the distance. My heart skipped a beat as the glow intensified, taking the shape of an old-fashioned gas station sign. It couldn't be. The gas station was gone. But there it was, materializing before my eyes like a haunting apparition. My hands trembled as I started recording and photographing the eerie scene. The sign flickered, and the station seemed to waver like a mirage. As I approached, I could hear faint whispers carried by the wind, voices of the lost and the restless. Against my better judgment, I entered the station, drawn by an inexplicable force. Inside, time seemed to lose its meaning, and the air grew thick with a sense of foreboding. The same hunched figure from before emerged from the shadows, still wearing that haunting smile. This time, I resisted the urge to flee. Instead, I mustered all my courage and asked the question that had been haunting me since that night. What is this place? Who are you? The figure's vacant eyes locked onto mine, and his voice echoed with a strange mixture of sorrow and malevolence. We are the forgotten, the ones trapped between worlds. We yearn for release, but the curse binds us here. In that moment, I felt a surge of empathy for the lost souls trapped in this timeless purgatory. I couldn't help but wonder if there was a way to freedom, to break the curse that held them captive. As I continued to explore the gas station, I found old journal and artifacts shedding light on the history of the place and the people who once inhabited it. It became clear that the station was more than just a gateway, it was a focal point for lost souls and unresolved mysteries, a limbo that held them in perpetual torment. But before I could uncover more, a powerful gust of wind swept through the station and the apparitions began to fade. The figure warned me to leave before it was too late, as if the station itself was closing its doors to our world once more. With a heavy heart, I stepped back out into the night, the gas station vanishing behind me. As I drove away, I knew that my encounter with the wandering gas station had changed me forever. I now carry the burden of knowing about the lost souls stuck in that timeless purgatory, yearning for freedom. Though I might never have all the answers or fully comprehend the mysteries of that place, I couldn't forget the haunting faces and voices that echoed in my mind. The encounter had opened my eyes to a hidden world that existed just beyond our perception, a world of forgotten souls and inexplicable occurrences. And it was a world I could never let myself forget, no matter how much I wished to leave it behind. This chilling encounter took place not too long ago, and the memory still sends shivers down my spine. I was an avid nature lover and enjoyed taking long walks in the woods near my house. It was my way of escaping the stress of everyday life and finding solace in the tranquil beauty of nature. One evening, unable to sleep, I decided to take a late night walk in the forest. It was a clear night, and the moonlight cast an eerie glow over the trees, creating strange shapes and shadows that seemed to dance around me as I walked. As I meandered through the familiar trails, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched the rustling leaves and distant sounds of wildlife didn't seem as soothing as they usually did. However, I dismissed my unease, attributing it to my restless state of mind. The further I ventured into the woods, the more the feeling of being watched intensified. I convinced myself it was just my imagination, but my heart continued to pound in my chest. That's when I heard it, a faint whisper carried by the wind. Hello, is someone there? I called out, trying to sound brave. Silence greeted me, but the unsettling feeling didn't subside. I quickened my pace, hoping to reach a more populated area, but the forest seemed to stretch on endlessly. My anxiety was reaching its peak, and I considered turning back, but something kept urging me forward. Finally, as I approached a clearing, I saw him, a tall, shadowy figure standing at the edge of the trees. My blood turned to ice, and I couldn't move. The moonlight revealed his silhouette, but his face remained hidden in the darkness. Who are you? What do you want? I stammered, my voice trembling. This stranger didn't respond. Instead, he took a slow step toward me, and I felt my fight-or-flight response kick in. My instincts screamed at me to run, but my body felt frozen in place. Just then, a sudden burst of courage surged through me. I turned and sprinted back the way I had come, my heart pounding in my ears. I didn't dare look back, fearing what I might see. As I ran, the whispering sounds seemed to follow me, growing louder and more menacing. It was as if the forest itself was taunting me, playing tricks on my mind. The trees swayed eerily in the wind, and the shadows seemed to come alive with malevolence. Finally, I burst out of the woods and into the safety of the streetlights that lined the nearby road. I glanced back one last 
last time, but there was no sign of the mysterious figure. My heart was still racing, and I struggled to catch my breath. I hurried back home, vowing never to venture into those woods again at night. The encounter had left me shaken and questioning my sanity. I wondered if I had stumbled upon some dangerous individual or if my mind had played tricks on me in the darkness. Unable to shake the feeling of dread, I reported the incident to the local authorities. They assured me they would increase patrols in the area, but they found no evidence of anyone lurking in the woods. The weeks that followed the eerie encounter were filled with anxiety and sleepless nights. The memory of the shadowy figure lurking in the woods plagued my thoughts, leaving me on edge even in the safety of my own home. I began to question whether I should have reported the incident to the authorities, fearing that I might have drawn attention to myself from someone with ill intentions. To ease my restless mind, I confided in a close friend about the strange encounter. She listened attentively, offering reassurance and understanding. She encouraged me to join her on walks during the day, hoping that the presence of a companion would help ease my fears. Despite my lingering unease, I decided to give it a try. We strolled through the familiar forest trails, the sunlight filtering through the leaves, casting a warm glow on the surroundings. With my friend by my side, I felt a glimmer of the comfort and tranquility I used to find in these woods. As we walked, my friend shared her own stories of feeling uneasy in certain places and how she coped with those feelings. It was a relief to know that I wasn't alone in my fears, and her support helped me regain some of my lost confidence. However, my unease returned as the sun began to set, reminding me of the unnerving encounter that had occurred under the moonlit sky. I could feel the grip of fear tightening once again, and I was ready to call it a day and head back home. But just as we turned to leave, I caught a glimpse of something familiar in the distance, a tall, dark figure standing among the trees. My heart pounded, and I froze, unable to believe what I was seeing. Was this the same person from before? How had they found me again? I clung to my friend, whispering urgently, do you see that? It's him. My friend looked in the direction I was pointing, but when she turned back to me, her face was puzzled. I don't see anyone. Are you sure you're okay? She asked, concern etched on her features. Doubt gnawed at my might. Had my fear conjured up the figure once more? Was it a trick of the fading light? My friend's reassurance did little to calm my racing heart. Reluctantly, we decided to continue our walk, but the feeling of being watched didn't dissipate. My eyes darted around the trees, half expecting the shadowy figure to emerge at any moment. I couldn't shake the sensation that we were being followed, even though I had no concrete evidence. As we neared the exit of the forest, a sudden rustling in the underbrush caused us both to jump. I turned around, fully expecting to see the figure charging at us, but instead, it was a startled deer leaping away into the trees. My friend gave me a gentle squeeze on the shoulder. It's okay. Sometimes our minds can play tricks on us, especially after experiencing something frightening. She said soothingly. I nodded, trying to rationalize my fear. Perhaps it had all been in my imagination. Maybe the first encounter had heightened my senses, making me more prone to see things that weren't there. Over the following weeks, I continued to explore the woods during the day, gradually regaining some of the peace and tranquility I had once associated with them. The memory of the eerie encounter still lingered, but it no longer consumed me. While I couldn't entirely explain the strange experiences I had, I learned to trust my instincts while also acknowledging the power of imagination. Sometimes fear could take on a life of its own, creating shadows where there are none. The woods remained a place of solace and adventure, but I always made sure to heed the lessons learned from those late night encounters. And though the unsettling memories occasionally resurfaced, they also served as a reminder of the strength I found in overcoming my fear, and reclaiming the beauty of the natural world once more. This unsettling story happened to me during my first year of college when I moved into a shared apartment near campus. The apartment complex seemed like a typical college housing option, nothing out of the ordinary. Little did I know that my new roommate would turn my life upside down. At first, everything seemed normal. I was excited to start this new chapter of my life and looked forward to getting to know my roommate better. Let's call her Sarah. She was friendly, cheerful, and we hit it off right away. However, as the days passed, I noticed peculiarities about her behavior that left me feeling uneasy. Sarah had a habit of disappearing for long stretches without any explanation. At times, she would be out for days without a word, and then she would return as if nothing had happened. When I asked about her whereabouts, she would brush it off, claiming she was visiting friends or spending time at her family's place. As weeks turned into months, her absences became more frequent, and she began to withdraw from our circle of friends. It was as if she had a secret life outside of the apartment, one she didn't want anyone to know about. One evening, as I was studying in my room, I overheard Sarah talking on the phone. She spoke in hushed tones, and although I couldn't make out the details, her conversation sounded intense and secretive. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously off. 
curiosity got the best of me, and one day, while she was out, I decided to look around her room. I felt guilty invading her privacy, but my gut feeling told me that I needed to find out what was going on. Inside her room, I found stacks of notebooks filled with what seemed to be coded writings and obscure symbols. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. The room was cluttered with strange trinkets and items that seemed to hold hidden meanings. My heart raced as I realized I had stumbled upon something much deeper and more sinister than I could have ever imagined. I didn't know what to make of it all, but I knew that Sarah was involved in something that went far beyond ordinary college life. Despite my fears, I didn't confront Sarah directly. Instead, I discreetly asked around campus, trying to gather information about her mysterious activities. Some mentioned her involvement in strange rituals and gatherings late at night, while others spoke of her fascination with the occult. I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't over my head. The more I delved into the mystery, the more I feared for my safety. I didn't know who I could trust or what secrets Sarah might be hiding. One night, as I lay awake in my bed, I heard muffled voices and chanting coming from the living room. Theo gripped my heart, and I realized that Sarah had brought her secretive practices into our apartment. I decided that I couldn't stay there any longer. I packed my belongings in a haste, making sure to leave no trace behind, and moved out without saying a word to Sarah. I found a new place to live, far away from the darkness that had enveloped my old apartment. After moving out of the apartment, I tried my best to put the unsettling experience behind me. I focused on my studies and surrounded myself with friends who brought positivity into my life. Still, the memory of Sarah and her mysterious activities lingered in the back of my mind like a haunting shadow. As the months passed, rumors about Sarah's bizarre behavior spread around campus. Some claimed to have witnessed her participating in peculiar ceremonies late at night, while others spoke of strange symbols and writings she would display in public places. I found solace and confiding in a close friend who had known Sarah before she became reclusive. To my surprise, my friend admitted that she had also noticed peculiar changes in Sarah's behavior during their time as roommates. She had moved out early on, feeling uncomfortable around Sarah's newfound fascination with the occult. They couldn't help but wonder what had happened to Sarah to lead her down such an unusual and unsettling path. Some speculated that she had fallen in with a fringe group, while others believed she might have encountered something dark and dangerous during her absences from the apartment. Despite our curiosity, we knew better than to delve further into Sarah's secrets. It was clear that whatever she was involved in had the potential to be harmful, and we were not equipped to confront such mysterious forces. In an attempt to find closure, we decided to reach out to Sarah's family. We discovered that she had cut off communication with them, leaving them deeply concerned about her well-being. They were as puzzled and worried as we were, desperate to understand the changes in their daughter. Months turned into a year, and Sarah's strange presence became more like a ghostly legend around campus. Few had seen her, and those who had reported that she seemed like a shell of her former self. It was as if she had become a different person entirely. One day, an email circulated campus announcing that Sarah had withdrawn from the university. No explanation was given, leaving us all to wonder what had happened to her. Her abrupt departure only added to the air of mystery that surrounded her. As time passed, the rumors about Sarah's occult involvement subsided, but the unsettling memories remained etched in the minds of those who had encountered her during that dark chapter. I eventually graduated and moved on with my life, but I couldn't help but feel a tinge of sadness for Sarah. Whatever path she had chosen led her to a place of isolation and darkness, and I hoped that one day she would find her way back to the light. The encounter with Sarah changed me in profound ways. It taught me to be cautious about about the people I trust and to listen to my intuition when something feels off. I realize that some mysteries are not meant to be solved and that it's okay to walk away from situations that bring discomfort and fear. The story of Sarah and her enigmatic journey is a haunting reminder that the human mind is a labyrinth of secrets and sometimes we can never fully comprehend what lies within another person's soul. As the years pass, her memory remains a reminder that some encounters can forever alter the course of our lives, leaving us with more questions than answers and a deeper appreciation for the fragility of our own minds. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. A few years ago, I was renting a house in Northern California. The neighborhood was just outside the suburbs. It seemed like the perfect balance of having space and having nice neighbors close enough to not feel isolated. The area had no streetlights, so it was very dark at night, especially if there were no clouds blocking the moonlight. It didn't bother me though. It made my little house feel even more quaint on dark nights. I got home from work one day in midwinter. It was a cloudy night, so pulling up to my house, I saw only what my headlights and front porch light illuminated. When I got out of my car, I caught a whiff of cigarette smoke. That was odd, as I had never smelled that before around the house. I didn't see anyone nearby, so I ignored it and went inside. I had just got off a shift with a few hours of overtime, so I felt pretty tired. Even though it wasn't even 7 yet, I decided to take a shower and call it a night. I woke up sometime later sure that I had heard a noise inside my house. 
I wasn't worried right away because my friend would sometimes stop by to use my shower after work on his way to his night classes. I even gave him a spare key so he could stop by even if I wasn't home. He would always text me to let me know beforehand though and I hadn't heard my phone go off. I reached over to my bedside table and picked up my cell phone to see if my friend had sent me a text. The bright light from my phone screen and number pad blinded me. Through squinted eyes, I could make out it was a 9 or something, but I couldn't tell if I had an unread text or not. I set my phone aside and called out my friend's name. There were a couple seconds of silence before I heard loud footfalls as someone started running through the bottom floor of my house. I leapt out of bed and ran to the closet. They were already up the stairs by the time I had opened the door and stepped inside. That house had three rooms upstairs, two bedrooms on either side of the hallway, the one that was in a spare, and a bathroom at the end. The bedroom doors were both closed, but the bathroom door was cracked open. I heard whoever was in my house thunder down the hallway past my door and into the bathroom. Thank god they did. They gave me enough time to open the attic access to the ceiling of my closet and hoist myself up. I just started to lift myself up when the person ran back out of the bathroom. My feet were barely inside of the attic when my bedroom door burst open. I heard footsteps run into my room and stop. When they didn't see me in that room, they ran back to the hallway and into the other room which just had boxes stacked in a corner, some weights, and a table where I painted my miniature models. I guess they decided that if someone were hiding, it would be in the bedroom because they charged back into my room and turned the light. A moment later the closet door was ripped open. I was crouched on my attic just a foot or so away from the access, so I could try to stop them if they had started to climb up. From my vantage point all I could see was from about their knee down. They were wearing dirty blue jeans with frayed cuts and worn work boots. After a few seconds of looking into the closet, he stepped away and I heard a loud crash come from my room followed by a scream of frustration and anger. That scream was the most unnerving part of the incident for me. Whoever it was in my house ran back down the stairs. I heard crashes and clatters as things were thrown around and furniture was knocked over. I stayed crouched in the attic. I had left my cell phone when I ran for the closet and I wasn't certain I could climb down without him hearing. After some time, the noises stopped. I started counting slowly and when I reached a thousand, I decided it was safe enough to climb down and call the police. The first thing I noticed when I exited the closet was the intruder had flipped my bed over. I assumed in an attempt to find me. That was the last noise I heard after they stepped away from the closet. I couldn't find my cell phone, so I went to the landline by the bed and called the police. I waited in my room until I heard them call from downstairs. The first floor was a mess, but I expected that. Chairs had been knocked over, the sofa had been flipped, all the books, pictures, and knickknacks I had on my shelves were strewn all over the floor. The cupboards in the kitchen had been opened and all the box and canned foods had been thrown to the ground. As far as I could tell though, the only thing missing was a single knife out of the wooden block in my kitchen. The police checked the house from top to bottom. They also found a few cigarette butts along my fence line along with some foil and an empty pin tube which the police said people often use to smoke meth with. So they think they had been watching my house for a while. I realized that they must have been out there smoking a cigarette when I got home. They collected up the evidence and told me I should stay with my family or friends that night and get that door fixed as soon as possible. I opted to just not sleep. I moved a shelf over to block the broken door and spent the next couple hours cleaning things up. I would often go to the window with a flashlight and shine it along the fence line where the police found the cigarette butts and foil, but I didn't see anything. The next day I called to have the door fixed and motion lights installed at the back and sides of my house. I lived there another three years without incident. My boyfriend, who I live with, works as a teacher in a town about 15 minutes away by train. He gets home more or less at the same time every day, give or take an hour or so. I, on the other hand, work from home. In late January of this year, we got in a pretty big fight about something stupid. I can't remember what it was by now, but it was one of those fights where we didn't speak to each other, text, or call, or anything the whole next day. So this afternoon I was lying in bed getting work done. It was a Tuesday and I'm pretty sure his last class finished at 1pm on Tuesdays, meaning he'd surely be home at 2.30. But around 1pm I heard the front door open and shut. I thought, huh, I guess he's home an hour early today. It was normal for him to skip his class every once in a while so I didn't really think anything of it. In fact, I was mostly mentally preparing for the awkward post fight, hey how's it going conversation. So I continued to lie in bed and do my work and wait for him to come in and change his clothes. The bedroom door was closed and I had earplugs sort of half in, as I usually do when I'm working. But I could hear the heavy footsteps of him walking around the apartment, as he always does. If we hadn't been mid-fight and I wasn't so preoccupied with the awkwardness of all of it, I might have noticed it was strange how slow the footsteps were or how long he spent walking around the living room. But I was caught up in the dramatics of the fight and didn't think about it. I was just lying there, waiting, waiting, and waiting for him to finally come in. Finally, the bedroom door slowly opened just a few inches. I turned my head towards the door and prepared to give him a sort of awkward, we've been fighting for 24 hours, huh, smile. But the door didn't open more than a few inches. I looked and saw that it was a woman's hand with red nail polish on the doorknob. Whoever was there slowly closed the door just as they opened it, without entering the room. I jumped out of bed, ripped out my earplugs, and sort of froze there for a few seconds while thinking rapidly. My first thought, that was not my boyfriend. Then I thought, 
Could that have been his mom, his sister, the landlady? For some reason, I concluded that surely it was his mom or sister. So I opened the bedroom door and walked into the living room. There wasn't anyone there, but the room smelled heavily of women's perfume. Then I came to my senses and realized his mom and sister don't have keys and have never come before. The landlady has never entered without permission. This was a stranger. I went back into my bedroom and shut the door, now shaking heavily. There was a balcony connected to the bedroom, so despite the cold January rain, I stood on the balcony and called my boyfriend. He picked up and I asked him if his mom or sister might have come over unannounced. He told me, no, don't move, I'm calling the police. The police were there in minutes and searched the whole apartment. Of course, nobody was there by this point. It was weird though. Nothing was missing from the apartment despite us keeping a jar full of money right in the entrance. Nothing was even touched. In fact, it seemed like the intruder came straight in the bedroom, saw my legs on the bed, panicked, and left. Plus, you can't open that big wooden front door without a key. Nevertheless, we demanded that the landlady change her locks. When she came to change them with her husband, she made a discovery. There was a square area by the keyhole that had been scratched away with something. The landlady said surely someone used tools to break into the apartment. I never got to meet the person who opened the door that day, and I hope I never do. Okay, this happened in 2016 when I was a 17 year old first year college student in film school. I lived alone in my first ever apartment. I never felt unsafe in this apartment for several reasons. There were multiple gates in the residence that needed to be opened through a code only the people who lived there knew, and my door had three different locks and it was right next to the university, so most people who lived in the neighborhood were college students. Nothing bad had ever happened in the neighborhood before. I've always been very careful with locking the door when I leave my home. I always check it twice. So this one time, I leave to go to class and lock my door but for some reason I couldn't get the key out of the lock. It was completely stuck so I went to get the caretaker of the building to help me, but he wasn't there and I was getting late for class, so I went to class with the key still in the lock. I took off the keychain first so it's not too noticeable. When I got home, the caretaker was back so he came to help me and we couldn't get it off for 15 minutes until somehow he did. He told me the lock was damaged but that I didn't necessarily need to change it if I only locked it once instead of twice. I just said okay and that was the end of it. I really wasn't worried because of how safe I felt in this building. Flash forward to two months later, I was taking out the trash one night around 11pm. While on the phone with my sister, I remember telling her that I was taking out the trash. Then I would take a shower afterwards before heading to a party. As I previously said I always locked the door, even just to take out the trash. Because of my lock being damaged, I only locked it once. When I got back to my apartment, I found the door unlocked which immediately alarmed me. So I went to the apartment and locked the door immediately, with three different types of locks. When you walk into my apartment, which is just 215 square feet, you have the main room in front of you and the bathroom door immediately to your left. I left the bathroom door slightly open, enough so I could see a man in my shower, turning his back to me. Naturally, when I saw this, I tried to open the door and leave as fast as possible, except my main lock was damaged from two months earlier and I couldn't open it no matter how hard I tried. In this moment, all I could think of was the fact that I had to leave as fast as possible. I jumped out the window without really thinking. I figured it was the only solution, except I'd live on the second floor, so I completely smashed my ankles in the landing. I started running in whichever way I could and when I got a little bit further from the building, I looked back and a man was there, at my window, watching me run away. I thought of two possible outcomes, either the man was going to jump and chase me, except I wouldn't get far with my twisted ankles, or he would get scared of the height and be locked in my apartment. Thankfully, he picked option two. I went to hide in a bush a little further and called the police, who arrived in just 10 minutes because I lived close to the station. They pushed my door open and the man was there just sitting on my couch, holding a kitchen knife, waiting for me to come back, like he didn't think I would call the police. They arrested the guy and later told me he had already been arrested for attempted kidnapping and attempted murder. They also told me how everything had happened. Like I said, it was a very friendly neighborhood with mostly college students, so he got inside the building by other people holding the door for him. He then heard me telling my sister I was going to take a shower, which was why he was waiting in the bathroom for me. He crocheted my lock while I was taking out the trash. He apparently noticed me on my school campus and followed me to my home several times before succeeding to actually come in. He stayed inside waiting for me because I had recently changed my phone and the previous one was still on the table, so he thought I didn't have a phone with me to call the police. I don't live there anymore, but after that, to get into the building, we all needed identification proving we lived there. Building IDs were created and we had to scan them every time and it was the only way to go inside the building. Nothing really bad happened in the neighborhood after that. It's back to being very peaceful and friendly. A friend and I played after school hockey. It wasn't a popular sport so our games took place at another school which was incredibly far away and pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The area didn't have any train stations so we relied on three different buses to get there and again to get home. The games usually took place pretty late and ended around 7 to 8 p.m. when it was dark. All the other girls in our team got picked up by their parents, but we always busted together home. 
We didn't feel it was dangerous because there were two of us and being classic 12 year olds, we thought we were mature enough to be independent. Because we had to change buses three times and we lived so far away, by the time we got to our second bus stop it was usually pitch black. The second bus stop was desolate, far off from the school, in front of some kind of abandoned building and basically a bit creepy. The stop was small, it wasn't sheltered, it was just a steel pole with a bus painted on the sign. On this particular night, it wasn't raining as well, so we felt extra miserable standing out in the cold. The buses in my area are also notoriously unreliable, so it wasn't unusual for us to wait an hour at this bus stop. That night it definitely felt like we had been waiting there for over an hour when a car pulled up in front of us. A woman was in it. She rolled down her window and asked us where we were going. I told her the suburb we lived in, which was an hour drive away and she said she could give us a lift if we wanted. If it had been a man, I would have immediately been suspicious and liked it. But because she was a youngish woman, looked about 40, it didn't raise any red flags in my mind. I remember thinking that she must be understandably worried about two young girls standing out in the rain at night. I smiled and thanked her and said it was okay and we would wait for the bus. She hesitated and then drove away. But a few minutes later, she came back and pulled up in front of us again. She told us her daughter wasn't at a play and that she was going there anyway to pick her up, so are we sure we didn't want to lift? My friend was almost about to get in, but I hesitated. Maybe thanks to my parents drilling me about stranger danger, and I said thank you, but it was alright, we'll wait. She was a bit pushier this time and asked us if we were sure quite a few times and mentioned her daughter again, but eventually she drove away. At this point, I think my intuition was telling me that it felt a bit weird that she hadn't mentioned her daughter earlier. Another few minutes later, she came back again. This time, she said that she had just driven past our bus further down the road and then it obviously skipped our stop, so she offered to give us a lift to try to catch up to it. This sounded unlikely to me. By this point, I was super suspicious. I didn't really have any time to think, so it was just a bad gut feeling, rather than any logical reasoning. With all the politeness and smiles gone, I straight up just said no. I could tell my friend, who was about to get into her car before, was also starting to feel weird about it because she backed away from the road. The woman hesitated for a while. It lapsed into an awkward silence and I remember she just kept glancing at her back seat. I remember holding my hockey stick tight and playing in my brain how I was going to defend myself. It honestly felt like forever before she finally drove away. A few minutes later the bus came and I had never been so relieved in my life. By this point, we were absolutely soaked. To this day, I still don't know whether she was just worried, a good Samaritan, or a potential kidnapper. I flipped between the two and honestly I can't decide. My friend also thinks it's a mystery. We don't know if we were just being paranoid. This was around 2015 and I was living in Seattle. I worked in an office that allowed me to bring my dog to work. A 100 pound German Shepherd. He's a big sweetheart but looks quite scary to strangers. After work one day, I got on the bus home, which was around a 45 minute ride. I noticed someone stared at me and didn't think much of it. While it's unsettling to be watched, I've had my fair share of odd conversations on the bus and it wasn't out of the ordinary to encounter such weird behavior. I honestly don't remember too much about his appearance, but I do remember thinking he looked fairly normal and didn't seem high or drunk. My bus stop was on a busy street in a bit of a sketchier part of town, but it's not frequently trafficked. When we reached the stop, my dog and I set off on the short trek home, only a few blocks away. As I exited the bus, I noticed the men who had been watching me had exited too. Something was off about him. He seemed intent on keeping stride with me, trailing closely behind. I've heard advice somewhere in the past that you shouldn't go straight home if you're being followed. I'm sure that's situation specific and sometimes it's safer to be in your home, but nothing had happened besides having my personal space invaded and didn't feel immediately unsafe. So I opted not to leave this stranger straight to my door. I knew that my partner at the time wasn't at home, so I decided the best plan was to weave through my neighborhood for several blocks to try to lose him. I think a part of me was also wanting to be sure I was being followed at all or if this person just happened to be walking in the same direction. After several blocks, it became clear he was following me. I was weaving around erratically and he was walking the same path. Neither of us spoke to one another and I was becoming more and more frustrated that anyone would follow a woman home. The streets were quiet and I couldn't see anybody around who I could signal to for help. I don't think I would have been so surprised this was happening if I was alone and without my dog. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind following someone with a large German Shepherd. I started walking faster when I rounded a corner and quickly ducked into a hallway, hugging a duplex a block from my house. I was hoping the pathway would wrap around the house completely so I could get out of the line of sight of this person, but was met with a fence to my face and didn't have time to backtrack. I was ultimately cornered in this nook between a house, a fence, and a hedge. I crouched down with my dog and waited for the guy to pass us. I watched as the man strolled by the walkway, seemingly not noticing us at all. He didn't turn his head or even gaze in our direction. I decided that we'd stay there for a few minutes just to make sure he was gone. About three minutes went by. Just as I was thinking it was safe to head home, the man stepped into my line of sight. He didn't make eye contact with me, just as he had it in the first time he walked by. He was moving calmly and deliberately, and slowly came to a stop as soon as he was right in front of me, just off the curb. He was about two yards away, facing me, and not directly looking. 
with just a sidewalk and a grassy strip between us. I watched him as he started to unload his pockets. He had a number of metal objects he was taking out, placing them in a line. To this day, I'm not sure what they were, but I'm glad I didn't find out. At this point, I called 911 and told them what was happening, that someone was following me and showing erratic behavior. The cops made it there quickly, and as soon as they pulled up, the dispatcher advised me to get out of there. I hightailed it out of my hiding spot and took a non-direct path home since my house was technically in the line of sight of where I was crouched. I don't know what ended up happening with him, but fortunately never saw him again, and I don't know if he had malicious intent. This happened when both me and my friend Jay were 15. I was spending the night at his house, as I often did. It was a normal enough night, we watched movies, played a couple video games, and stayed up way too late. It was about 2am I think when we heard a loud banging coming from the front door. Luckily at the time we were in his kitchen at the back of the house, so no one could see us. We were spooked because there couldn't have been anyone at the door at this hour, but we figured it was just some drunk person and they'd go away soon enough. After 30 seconds, there was more banging on the door and yelling that neither of us could understand. It sounded like an adult man, and he sounded angry so we both were scared. He texted his mom, who we thought was upstairs, but she said that she had just left a bit before without saying anything. She did that often enough. She liked to go to her friend's houses in the middle of the night, so we didn't pay any attention or notice when she left. We didn't know what to do, as we were scared to call the police based off past experiences with cops in our small town being not the best. At this point, we turned off the kitchen light and we were ducked down on the ground. We heard the banging and yelling getting louder, and I decided to see who it was, if it was anyone we knew. I armed me crawled through the dining room, which was also dark and peeked through the door to the living room, which is where the front door was. There was also a huge window by the door that you can see right into the dining room though, so I was very careful not to be seen. I couldn't see any details of the man, but he looked to be about 6 feet tall and had grey hair. I crawled back to Jay and we quietly decided what to do. We heard the knocking stop, so we decided to wait a bit before seeing if it was safe. We also decided to go around the table in the dining room, in case he tried to come around back, which is where the kitchen was. After around 10 minutes of silence, we rock paper scissors for who had to check if he was there, and of course I lost. So I again army crawled to the dining room door. I saw the man staring through the window, hands cupped up against the glass. I made eye contact with him, and the moment he saw me, and I loudly said, causing my friend to panic and crawl behind me. I saw him pull out his phone, and he told me later that he was texting his mom to come home and save us. The man started yelling again, and this time we could make out a bit more of what he said. It was mostly cussing, although I definitely heard the phrase, I'm gonna kill you, in there a couple times. I quickly looked past the man to see if any of the neighbors seemed to notice him, but no luck. I crawled back out of his sight and again discussed what to do with my friend. We decided to go into the basement for safety, which you could get to by moving the fridge. Confusing house I know, but it was really old and not meant for modern sized appliances. We pull out the fridge and get into the basement, feeling mostly safe but still terrified. I start having a panic attack, although I'm trying to hold it together best I can for Jay, who is also on the verge of a panic attack. We hear a gunshot and shattering glass from above us, and I cover my mouth so I don't scream. Jay and I look at each other, terrified. We hear loud footsteps and yelling above us, the man asking where we went. We hear him going upstairs and run around up there for a bit. He eventually comes back down and starts turning over our furniture, I'm assuming to find us. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, Jay's mom pulls into the driveway, which scares the guy as he runs out the back door in the kitchen. Jay and I get out of the basement and run to greet his mom, never happier to see her. She was shocked by the state of the house and hugged us, happy that we were safe and scared by how close we were to being hurt. We were all scared after that. After that night they had better security installed, and we went over safety protocol if anything ever happened again. Luckily it hasn't happened again yet, and I hope it never will. I work at a convenience store. I've had some creepy customers come in before, but this one was a little more disturbing. If it weren't for what had been said and done, I don't think this would have been that bad. I normally work third shift, which is around 4pm to around 12am, and I'm by myself for the last 4 hours of my shift. This man had come in earlier that day and was acting odd, jittery, chewing at his lip constantly, fumbling with his debit card, to the point I did everything for him except putting the pin in. Fast forward to around 10.30pm, I'm sweeping the floors as I'm supposed to do every night when the man entered. He approached my register and asked him what he needed. Hey, can I have one of those lighters? I pick one up and go to scan it, but he tells me that he doesn't have any money. I tell him he can't have it and he glares at me before leaving. A man was in line behind him and the entire time I was scanning his things, the lighter guy was staring at me through the window right next to my register. He eventually walks off and the man jokes about the creepy guy asking for a lighter when the man in line didn't even have his with him. He tells me to be safe, then walks out to the gas station pumps. 
I start sweeping again, but when I turn around and move a small crate out of the way, the creepy guy is staring at me again, just watching me work. I quickly make my way to the back room to make mop water so I could get away from him for a second. He stayed there for a solid 5 minutes before stalking off again. I grabbed a random receipt as a cover and basically bolted to the man at the gas pumps. I got close and asked if he was in a hurry to go anywhere. I told him that the creepy lighter guy was still hanging around and that it was really freaking me out. He promises me that he didn't plan on actually leaving after getting gas. At this point, I thought it wouldn't take up too much of his time, since we both thought the man was already wandering away from the store. Unfortunately, he went back toward the store a few seconds later. Soon, an older woman comes in and I warn her about the creepy guy. She asked what I was talking about and I subtly nod in his direction. Mind you, still hanging around my window. She looks a little disturbed, leaning in and whispering, What does he want? I explained that he wanted a lighter, but he didn't have any money so I didn't give him one. I told her to be careful and she quickly told me to worry more about myself since I was at the store alone. She left, and I saw the creepy guy approach the window again. Thankfully, he didn't look in, just hung around it like he was waiting for someone. After a while, a daughter of a family friend comes in with her girlfriend, and we quietly make small talk. Like the last woman, I warned them that the lighter guy was still roaming around and he could be dangerous. Before they get to tell me anything, a woman was talking with the guy from the gas pumps, spotted them while scanning family friend's items, and hurried in and told me to call the cops. Obviously, not familiar with the area I worked in and hearing three different people telling me what numbers to call, I was shaking and in near tears. My family friend said she would call while I calmed down. Another girl had run out at this point, and I don't blame her. Family friend's girlfriend told me that lighter guy threatened to throw rocks through the window and hurt slash rob me. After about three minutes of pacing and trying not to cry, I saw my mom's truck pull in. I bolted to her, telling her what was going on. She calmed down and walked me back to the entrance. As this happened, creepy guy had climbed the hill and crossed the street to Bojangles and sat near the front door. The cops arrived. The man from the pumps gave a statement, I gave mine. And finally, family friend gave hers, which included the threats. From what was said, he was about to break into my car. The man that stayed with me stopped him, but that didn't stop the creep from roaming still. After we talked to the cops, they sped to Bojangles and confronted the lighter guy. After arguing, a quit pat down and more arguing, the man was put in the back of the cop car. Lighter guy, I knew you were probably on something, but please, let's not meet ever again. To set this story, I bike 5 miles one day, 5 days a week to my job, and I've been for 8 months. I honestly love it. It forces me to get exercise, and it's cheap transportation. I take the main road with a lot of traffic, so I've never felt unsafe. I also only ride on the sidewalk, since it's safer. One day, coming home, I was passing by an area with a lot of construction going on. To give you a better visual, I ride on the sidewalk along a busy road. As I'm biking, I see a man in a black pickup truck parked as if he's about to pull out of the area, but he's waiting for a spot to open in traffic. He then sees me and reverses to let me by. I remember thinking, oh great, he's letting me by, and I wouldn't have to ride around behind his car to get to the other side. But as I'm getting closer, he does a stop motion with his hand, and he's wearing a safety vest, so I assume he works there, and there might be a problem up ahead, like a pothole, etc., so I stop. He spoke with authority like as if he's an officer stopping me or something and asked if I bike for transport or leisure. I was a little confused since that's a weird question but I tell him for transport, I bike to my job. He then says, do you bike for leisure? I'm asking because I bought a bike and I'm looking for a riding buddy. I'm not freaking out or anything. I feel a little calm since there are a bunch of cars passing by us so we're not secluded but I don't know this man. He's a complete stranger and I was under the impression he worked there and was stopping me for something important. I tell him not really because I'm too tired on my days off and use them to get errands and stuff done. He says, oh I get it. Well there's a bike marathon happening soon if you want to go with me. I'm Shane by the way. What's your name? I tell him my name and say, oh I don't know, I might be busy then. I'm a little awkward in social situations with people I don't know and this whole interaction was just off so I don't really know what to say. He changes the subject and starts looking at my bike. He points at it and asks if it's a hybrid. I say yes and he says can I see it? And starts getting out of his car. This is where it starts getting weird. He tells me he's seen me riding before and I thought I was cute. He's also looking at my bike and commenting on it and saying stuff like, oh that's nice, it's aluminum, and I'm just feeling weird on the inside. I'm also sitting on my bike ready to get the f out of there. He then asks if I have a boyfriend and I tell him yes I do. He lets out a big groan and says, oh man really? Because if we go biking together it would be kind of a date thing. I tell him yeah sorry and he goes, are you sure? Are you ready to kick him to the curb or what? I just want to get out of here at this point but he parked his car literally in front of the sidewalk so it wouldn't be that easy to speed by him. He seemed upset and kept asking if I'm sure I have one and how long we've been together. I said, a couple years, well I'm crunched for time and I have to go, bye, and sped off. After that I had a mini vacation and was off for 5 days after that but now I'm back to riding to work again and I haven't seen him since. 
This probably happened maybe three or four weeks ago. So creepy older man who tricked me and blocked me on my bike, let's not ever meet again. This was back in 2014. I had moved off campus and into a really nice part of town. I was a junior in college and this was my first time living on my own. Campus was only two miles away so I would often walk back home from campus. I would take the bus or catch a ride with a friend to campus. I walked home because my schedule ending never quite matched up with the bus schedule and my friend finished two hours before my daily schedule did. I was used to walking the two miles to my apartment. I never thought anything of it because I walked through the busy area of my town, along the second main road. So there were always people around. My apartment was actually a stone throw from the most popular frozen custard shop in the area. Every night the parking lot would be packed. So I'm walking home like usual. I get to the frozen custard shop and notice there's a lot of people tonight. It was just something I always noticed and paid attention to. All of a sudden this huge red truck pulls up beside me. I'm cut off guard because I have headphones in. It takes about 30 minutes to an hour to walk home, so I'm normally listening to music or talking on the phone. I stop and take my headphones out and look at the truck. This man dressed like a country singer was sitting in the driver's seat. He looks at me and asks where the mall is. I put him in the direction to the mall. He said, I've been down that way. I'm a photographer and I'm supposed to be doing a photo shoot at a bar behind the mall. I've lived in this town going on three years now. I know where all the bars are located. Makes it easy when all of them are on the same street. I explained to him, there's no bars by the mall. They're all on Philly Street. He continued to insist on a bar being behind the mall. All of a sudden he just changes. He looked at me and asked me to step back, so I did. He looked me over and asked how tall I was. I told him 5'7". He then asked me, I'm doing that photo shoot, would you like to be a model for it? I told him I don't like any of my photos taken. He insisted, telling me I was beautiful and would look great. Almost like he's given up on the tactic, he moves to another. He then asked me where I live. I told him not far, he wanted more info. I pointed in the vague vicinity of my apartment, making a point not to actually point at it. This dude then asked me if I wanted a ride, I told him no, it's not far, I'll be fine. He kept insisting I let him give me a ride home. I kept telling him no, stepping farther away from his truck. He then out of nowhere asked me how he could get to the mall. I told him, go down this road, at the light turn left. The mall will be on your left. He thanked me and started to drive off. I walked slowly to my apartment. I watched his truck get to the light. Instead of turning left like I said, he went straight. Going straight leads into a small residential area that you need to know this town well to get through. I lived in that town from 2012 to 2017 and still can't figure my way through that area. I made sure that that truck was completely out of sight before I hightailed it to my apartment and locked the door. My dog didn't quite understand what was going on. All he really knew was he had to go to the bathroom pretty bad. I tried to distract him for 5 or 10 minutes to make sure the coast was clear. My heart sunk when I did finally take him out. The same red truck was parked near the parking lot behind my apartment building. The truck didn't belong there. I'm one that memorizes all the vehicles that are normal for the area. No one had a red truck like that. I went back in and texted people describing the man and the truck to them in case something happened to me. I did not go back out for hours. When I did, the truck was gone. I never saw the man or the truck ever again. To the man who probably tried to abduct me in front of the most popular venue in town on my way home, I hope I never see you again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. Okay, before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa, for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs. Two Sharpays, two German short hair pointers, and two Dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa, it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, maid, and gardener. Like, the average family usually employs them. It's not only for wealthy people, which seems to be a thing in other countries. For the story, our DW is Ellie, and our gardener is Vince. So, this happened in 2007 when I was just 9 years old. My older brother who was 10 and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad's surprising us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night, due to security reasons, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter Anne, who was like an older sister to us, 18 years old, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs would not shut up and how annoying it was. 
That's when I noticed it too. Sure, they'd bark, but it was usually the Dachshunds that yapped, with the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dogs' incessant barking and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either because my brother asked to investigate with them and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling and going nuts at a dark corner behind our in-the-ground swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that our garden beyond our pool hits like a slight decline. So we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad had noticed how the lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it worked the other night. Either way, my dad said he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of this and because of how out of the character the dogs were acting. He called after them, they'd usually come running, but tonight, they all just seemed to look at him, then turn back around and continue to go crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come out with him because of this off feeling. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dog seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out in the view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched the steps and as he put two and two together, he was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and an avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four of the men in balaclavas. All armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. That he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. My dad said something came over him before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, He's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. Assuming my dad couldn't understand, it's not common for white people to speak it, but my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said, in Zulu, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this f grab what we can, and go. The others seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge. They continued to say how he can't go back to jail again, and they need to get the f out of there before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English, pretending to not understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller scared guy started freaking out all the other guys, saying that they need to leave ASAP or else they'd get caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full on bickering amongst themselves. Their plan slowly turning to as a third guy had put it. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn to dart to the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm, mid ran and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly I know, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quick as possible without even thinking. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything. When my dad rushed to the bedroom door, slammed it shut and told us to go upstairs into the attic, quote unquote, there's five guys outside with guns, they're here to hurt us, get upstairs now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel, not too far behind. We sat there in darkness and silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just wanting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed saying she didn't have a phone, neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police and I kid you not, they asked where we live, we explained and they told us it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry, click, the line goes dead. We're now not only ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again and that's when my dad realizes. He didn't close the veranda door and what about Ellie and Vince? who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in. He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic and tells us whatever we hear, do not come downstairs. To stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad to not leave us, but he tells us he has to go get Eli and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. Anne's understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they say they'll be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They say to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, 
fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, most likely a couple minutes, we heard stomping coming up from the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was just my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, no one dared to speak. The dog seemed to have calmed down considerably, but we were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was just a security company, and sure enough, it was. He opened up and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police, and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there was actually seven pairs of footprints, and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed over. We got an electric fence shortly after, so there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family, and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and can manipulate the situation to benefit us. This takes place in the early 80s. I grew up in the suburbs in a very friendly townhouse complex. We all knew our neighbors. My first friends were the kids that lived in other townhouses. To describe my home, all townhomes are attached. They're also very tall and slender. I had six flights of stairs to go from the basement to the bedrooms on the top floor. We had a tiny driveway, and then there was the small roadway. On the other side was a raised flower bed that ran the length of the side of the townhouse wall across the street. The most important thing was a very bright street light in the middle of the planter. It shined ominously right into our front windows at night, and it had enough light to illuminate shapes above the kitchen counter on the third floor kitchen, just the top part of bodies. You didn't need to turn on the kitchen lights at night if you needed to get something. One night I had a sleepover with my friend who lived diagonal to me. Us gals had stayed up late in which of the kitchen for snacks. I peered out into the street to see an unfamiliar guy walking by on the roadway. There was no sidewalks. I noted to my pal that there was a weirdo walking by because he didn't seem right. He was tall and lanky with long 80s hair. With our familiarity with people in the neighborhood, we didn't recognize him. Our complex roadway did lead to a street, but it wasn't used as a shortcut because it was a long way to get around the neighborhood, so you didn't see others often, especially at night. As soon as I commented weirdo, he walked by our house. Only a couple of minutes later, he walked by again, going in the direction he came on the roadway. This time, we saw him out of the corners of our eyes coming along. Being scared kids, we immediately ducked as we were visible to the street. Up until then, we didn't think anything more of it but our instincts told us to hide, so we did. My friend said we were overreacting after a few minutes being crouched down, so we carefully peered over the counter. Weirdo hadn't walked by. He was now standing in front of the flower planter looking up at our house. To this day, I remember that bright street light illuminating him from behind very ominously. He looked like a horror film killer come to life. We hit the floor again thoroughly freaked out. I don't know how long we were there for. I could only hear the sound of our breathing for some time, until I thought I heard the squeak of the garage door handle. It was one of those old rusty ones that opened outward. I thought I was dreaming until I heard for the second time that rusty handle squeak. He was trying to get in now. My friend and I were frozen in fear. Luckily, my dad always locked the garage. The squeaking stopped. Even though my friend and I could have run upstairs or shut it to my parents, we were rooted on the spot thinking if we moved he'd get us somehow. We thought that was it as it was suddenly quiet. But a few minutes later I heard the swoosh of the screen door and telltale sound of the front door handle being pressed down. The first screen door was never locked, but thank god the wooden door always was. The noise repeated a few times. The metal scratching of the screen door hinge and the click of the front door latch. I wanted to piss my pants, and my friend looked like crying. Again, we were too silly enough to move or do anything to help ourselves. We just shook in terror and hoped he'd go away. He stopped trying to get in after about 5 minutes, and all we heard after that was silence. About 8 minutes later on the kitchen floor, we moved to stand up. I thought we were still pretty crouched down and invisible. That wasn't the case. This time we heard a clear voice. The other kitchen window near the pantry had its screen window open. Hey, I'm thirsty. Can I get a glass of water? My friend and I stared at each other in disbelief. He was still there. We didn't move, but someone had to eventually. My friend being the braver one decided to peek out the screen window while trying not to be seen. He must have heard her. I know you're there. Come on and let me in. I won't hurt you. This was the moment we decided to flee up those two flights of stairs to my bedroom. I always had an active imagination like most kids. I really hated that my bedroom was the very first one at the top of my stairs. My parents were at the back. Therefore in mind, I would be the first one to be murdered if someone broke in, and that fear was certainly tenfold that very night. My friend and I hunkered down on my bed, deep under the covers, shaking. We did not sleep at all, waiting for the click of a door or worse. We thought we heard him try again, but at that point we weren't sure if we were hearing things. Until the day I moved out, I never really felt totally comfortable in my bedroom ever again. 
I'm a 21 year old female and this story took place when I was around 11. I remember this day clearly because it was the first time I was ever allowed to walk to school and back by myself. Up until the age of 14, I lived in what we thought was a safe place in Chautauqua County, New York. Everyone knew everyone here. If you thought you would get away with something, then be prepared to have your ear chewed off by the time you get home. There was this one day though, it was a cold winter day and school unfortunately was still open so all the neighborhood kids had to walk through knee-high inches of snow just to get to school. It took me longer to leave the house as I was used to walking with my older sister to school since she knew the routes better than me. I always used to make fun of her for being paranoid and taking a different route every day from school, but after that day, I learned that was what saved my life. As I was waiting by the door to leave, my mom came up to me and told me that I should ride with her to drop me off because my sister was too sick to go today. Being a brat, I made a big deal about walking by myself because I was almost 12 years old and all my friends' parents let them walk alone. She looked at me for a long while, then told me to make sure I pay attention to cars. I got hit by a car and almost died when I was 9, so the worry that showed on her face was well warranted. I hurriedly nodded and headed out the door to go to school. My sister didn't like to dilly dally, so she was always in a rush to get to school early, but seeing as it was just me, I thought it would be a good idea to take my time. I would play in the brown slush that was on the left side of the road, and even made funny looking snowballs to see how far I could throw them. Halfway to school I noticed a white van following behind me. Being the playful child I was, if I had not been bending down and making another snowball, I wouldn't have noticed it slowly creeping up the street. I told myself I was being stupid, but continued more hurriedly to school. Once I got to school, I took a quick glance over my shoulder and saw the van a few feet behind me. It wasn't until I was on school grounds that it drove away fast by me. I thought that would be the end of it, but throughout the day when I would stare out the window, the van would be there. I assumed that it never really left, just parked. Many adults would try to convince me years later that maybe it wasn't the same one, but I knew it was. The van had a bright yellow smile emoji sticker on it. I couldn't see who was in the van, but through the tinted glass, I knew they could see me. It was now the end of the day and I wasn't ready to go home. It was too late to call my mom because she was at work and my sister was homesick. I had to suck it up and start walking home. I tried to blend in with a group of kids, but most of them were car riders and the others didn't live near me. Remembering what my sister told me, I took another route home. I didn't memorize this route clearly, but I decided anything was better than being spotted by that van. I made it to my main street, but realized my mistake too late. The route I took led back to the main street where I walked to school. Hidden behind a row of cars was the white van with a smiley emoji sticker. I tried to stay calm and walk past in, but once I heard the van door slightly click open, I ran. I could hear the rush of two pairs of heavy footfalls behind me. They were getting closer so I did what any normal kid would do. I cut corners. I cut into someone's backyard until I was directly inside of my house and forced myself into the thick snow to make it to the door. My heart was racing, not because I was running, but because I could still hear them behind me. I made it to the door and banged with all my might until someone came to the door. My sister looked confused, but one look at my face and she pulled me inside and locked the doors. The van was still outside. Truthfully, it stayed out there until my brother got home. Me and my sister don't talk about it, but we both knew how close it was to me going missing. Whoever you are that attempted to kin at me and do God knows what else, let's not ever meet again. When I was 20 years old, so 6 years ago, I worked as a delivery girl for a pretty popular pizzeria in my area. Initially, I worked the late morning to mid afternoon shift, but when the guy who delivered for the night shift ended up getting fired due to him losing his license because of a DUI, I was placed on the night shift since my boss hired a family friend who could only work my shift for whatever reason. I really didn't want this shift because you never know if people who order late at night actually want a pizza or if they have other intentions in mind. Unfortunately, my boss is not the nicest of people and essentially told me if I wasn't willing to work the night shift, I was fired. I wasn't exactly in a position where I could be out of work, albeit temporarily, so I reluctantly worked the shift. The first month of this shift, I went by without any issues until I had to deliver a pizza to a house that just barely made our delivery radius. I punched it in on my GPS, and the house was located in a pretty suburban part of the city. I arrive and it's about 11pm. The block was extremely quiet, decently lit, and mostly littered with modern townhouses, but the house I delivered to was a duplex. I ring the doorbell and wait for about 30 seconds. No answer. I ring it again and wait another 30 seconds. Still no answer. I'm standing there getting pretty nervous that something's about to go down. But thankfully a man opens the door. He looked like he was in his late 40s. He was pretty tall, maybe a little over 6 foot, and he was very skinny. I tell him his pizza is here and he just stands there staring at me. I asked him if he was okay and he responded by saying, Yeah, I'm fine, sorry. I got off work not too long ago and I'm just zoning out a bit. Fair enough, I suppose. He hands me the money. I hand him the pizza and as I'm making change he says, You're really beautiful, you know that? 
Not really thinking too much into it, I thanked him for the compliment and gave him his change. I said goodnight and he did too. I walked back to my car and finished my deliveries for the night. A few days later, I get a delivery order to the same place. I head over there around the same time as last time and ring the doorbell. He answers the door very excitedly and says, Hey, it's you again. How are you? I told him I was tired and I can't wait to go home to which he chuckled and said, I know that feeling pretty well, as he was pulling out his wallet. As he's counting his money, he asked me what my name is. Being kind of tired at this point and not really thinking straight, I stupidly told him my name. As I'm making a change, he asked if he could have my number, as he'd love to hang out with someone as gorgeous as I am. I've literally only met this guy like twice to deliver a pizza. I had no idea who this guy was, and I'm positive he barely knew who I was as well. Another thing to mention is I looked way younger than I was at that time. I was told by numerous people that I still looked like I was 15, and I was hoping he thought differently as he wasn't hitting on what he thought was a teenager. I'm just standing there awkwardly for a few seconds before I muster out, sorry, I have a boyfriend. He gets upset and says, oh okay, I see. We stand there in silence before I tell him to have a good night, and walk back to my car. He says nothing and still stands at the doorway, staring at me, until he finally went back inside once I started my car. I got a pretty creepy vibe from this guy, and even brought it up to my co-workers, and they agreed it was pretty creepy. Except for my boss, who overheard everything and claimed I was making up stories and trying to gain sympathy for having to take the shift. A week later as I'm working the night shift, we get an order from the same guy again and this is when it finally hits the fan. I arrive at the house at around 10.30pm and keep in mind that from my perspective on the road, it didn't look like a single light in the house was on. I get out of my car and I walk to the front door with the pizza box in my arms. As I approach the door, it quickly swings open to reveal the man, except this time, he was wearing a suit and I jumped back. He laughed and said, Sorry if I scared you. I saw you out on the window and I figured if I just opened the door now so you wouldn't have to ring the bell. I was getting scared because as I mentioned before, there were no lights on in the house. So he was sitting in the dark this whole time. And if so, why? I nervously laugh and say, it's okay. He asked me if I liked his suit which I said yes. He then asked me, would you like to go on a date with me tonight? I once again tell him I have a boyfriend to which he chuckles, gets close to me and says, there's no way a girl your age is in a serious relationship. You should really go on a date with me. He grabs the pizza box from me and throws it to the side and grabs me by my arms hard. I'm officially sweating bullets at this point and now I'm trying to cry from the fear that was overwhelming me. I start pleading with him. Dude, please. I just want to go home. I don't want to go on a date tonight. He just stares at me with the most sinister look I've ever seen on someone's face and says, I don't care. Get inside now. We're going to have a good time. He starts trying to pull me to the house, and I'm trying to resist as hard as I can. After a bit of struggling, he lets go of one of my arms and starts grabbing something out of his pocket, which I presumed was a knife. I did something to this day that I'm still thankful worked as he was doing that. I used my free arm to punch him as hard as I could in the stomach. This stuns me for a few seconds, and as he loosened his grip on me, allowed me to break free. I quickly run to my car, and as I get in, he runs at me and tries pulling me out of the car, holding the knife in the other arm and just starts yelling. I grab a half empty soda bottle I had in the cup holder and throw it and luckily it hits his head and he lets me go. I slam on the door and then all of a sudden he jumps right on the hood of my car and starts scratching and banging on my windshield with his knife. I put the car in reverse and quickly back out of the spot and quickly reverse down the road with him desperately trying to hold on. He's banging on my hood screaming, stop the car. I turn onto the next road as swiftly as possible and luckily he falls off the hood of my car. I slammed the gas as hard as I could to get away from him as far as I could. In my panicked state, I drove a couple blocks down the street and kept making turn after turn onto other side blocks as I feared I was being followed. Eventually, I reached a red light and I slammed on the brakes and just sat at the intersection frozen from what had just happened. I began crying and violently shaking as I was just sitting there. It dawned on me that I came so close to losing my life and I couldn't help but feel like I shouldn't have been alive. Once the light turned green, I pulled over to the side and just sat there crying. Eventually, I get the energy to drive back to the pizzeria, and almost immediately after I walk in, my coworker knew something was wrong after seeing me. I practically broke down in front of him, and everyone else came to the front wondering what was going on. I fought my tears, and explained everything that just happened. My coworker comforted me, and my boss surprised me, and began apologizing profusely for what had happened and for putting me on the night shift. He took me into the office and handed me the phone to call the cops. They arrived at the store, and I gave them my statement as well as taking pictures of any marks on myself, as well as scratches on my car for the encounter as evidence. My coworker followed behind me as I drove home and I collapsed on my bed and strangely enough, I managed to fall asleep. I quit my job the next day and luckily a friend of mine managed to hook me up with a new job at her clothing store. As far as the psycho goes, two days later I received an update from the police. The entire duplex is owned by the guy's brother who lived on the right side with his wife 
and the psycho lived on the left side of the duplex. I learned that he had been in and out of jail constantly at first for robberies and assaults. He had been released from jail about five months ago apparently. When they arrived at the house, he was long gone and his family had no idea where he ran off to, but the police insisted they would find him. And indeed they did, albeit not alive. I spent the next two months in fear that he would find me and finish what he had in mind, but the police contacted me and updated me on the case. Apparently, he fled to another city nearby and attempted to kidnap a teenager walking alone late at night on the street. Luckily, somebody happened to be looking out the window at the right time, called the cops, and the police caught him by trying to force her into his car. He manages to flee and the police chase after him. He blew a red light near a busy boulevard and a van slammed right into the driver's side of his car. By some sort of miracle, the driver of the van only sustained minor injuries while the psycho succumbed to his wounds long before the ambulance even arrived. I thanked the officers for everything they did and for informing me, so I walked out of the station. I walk down the street and I light up a cigarette as I'm taking in everything that I'd just been told. I don't wish death on people, but after hearing about his death, I felt relieved. I felt relieved that he couldn't hurt anyone anymore. I was relieved that I wouldn't have to ever encounter him again and that I wouldn't have to go through with charging him and reliving what happened that night. Who knows where I'd be if he managed to pull me into his house. I grew up in Ohio in the 70s, and me and my childhood friend Joe were outside all the time when we could manage it. Joe lived on a farm that bordered a pretty big forest, and my parents would drop me off in the morning and we'd stay in the woods all weekend. We'd only come out for school. We loved pretending that we were frontiersmen. We'd build shelters, traps, practice making fire with sticks, the whole nine yards. When we got to be in high school, we got this notion to pull a stand by me. This was based on the movie on the same name that just came out. The idea was that we'd walk the railroad tracks out in the country, but instead of looking for a dead body, we'd find cool bridges to fish from and to camp little ways off the tracks. Of course, we knew this was dangerous and we'd likely be trespassing, but we were kids. We had a lot of fun. We did find beautiful rivers. We discovered bridges no one went to. We fished. We hid from trains. At night, we camped in woods just near the tracks and made small hidden fires. Nothing bad ever happened. It was idyllic. In fact, it was so fun we did it multiple times. Never had a problem. After high school, me and Joe went our own ways. We both left home, but always stayed in touch and always tried to coordinate visits so we would see each other occasionally. Well, one summer in the mid-90s, it worked out that we were both in town for about a week. We would do stuff with family in the day, and at night, we'd either catch drinks at a bar or sit outside Joe's house around a fire and talk about the old days. One night, me and Joe got to talking about our stand-by me trips. Well, nostalgia and beer are a heck of a mix. Soon, we decided to take a day, walk the rails, camp one night, and walk home. The day came, we started out early morning. We had my wife drop us off in our old spot where we used to start, right outside our hometown. She thought this was absolutely crazy and made sure to mention it. When she pulled away, Joe suggested that instead of walking the usual route, we take the opposite direction, just to be adventurous. We knew the land well, we had a map, and so I gave it a screw it, and off we set. The day went fine. It was fun and a little sad, but in a good way. We found a bridge and sat on the edge, smoked a joint and moved on. We had no fishing gear, but we brought some canned food and other stuff. Before night started to set in, we picked a spot to camp. It was a thick forested area, trees on every side of the train tracks, so you felt like you were in a tunnel. We had brought small hammocks to sleep on, but before we set them up, we decided to do a little scouting of the perimeter. Now, this is what we used to do in the old days too. We'd walk the area around a little bit just to make sure some dude's house wasn't just over a hill and we were actually camping in their yard. We walked maybe a hundred or so feet into the woods and up a small incline. We figured if we didn't see anything from up top of the short hill, we'd be fine. But when we got to the top, we saw an old building down at the bottom, about a hundred yards into the woods. It was barely visible. We pondered over what to do. We both assumed it was a sugar shack or something, because there didn't appear to be any clear road into it. From where we were, there didn't look to be anyone in it either. All was quiet. No movement could be seen. No lights. We decided to walk a little closer, just to make sure. We came down the hill very slowly, and as we neared the building, we saw it and it wasn't a sugar shack at all. It was an old church. It looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was a squat, sagging building whose wooden planks were almost black from years of moss and rot. A cross still stood on top of the place, also weathered black. None of the windows had glass, and there were no doors, just open doorways. We got close enough to see inside. There were rows of pews in a built-up section in front for a preacher to stand. We didn't go all the way in. We didn't want to. Beyond all that, there was no sign of anyone else. No footprints, no paths, no roads. 
It was an abandoned church. We left immediately and went back up the hill to our spot that we had picked to camp. Having a hill between us and the church made us feel better, but we were still a little uneasy. We chalked it up just to the natural creepiness seeing a church in the middle of the woods would elicit. Besides, at this point it was dusk and we just decided to rake up our hammocks and go to sleep and move on at early morning. Night set in, and as we lay in our hammocks and just talked, we began to hear something in the direction of the church. Our conversation about it went a little like this. Do you hear that? What is that? It sounds like people singing. And it did sound just like singing. We both slid right out of our hammocks and hunkered down, straining to hear more. We listened for a minute or two, and the singing continued, but it wasn't getting louder. Finally, we decided to creep back up the hill and see if we could spy where the sound was coming from. We could still move very quietly in the woods from the old days. It was second nature to us. The moon was barely out, but it provided enough light so you wouldn't walk right into a tree, but it was near pitch black. We didn't use flashlights as we crept slowly up the hill, and we didn't talk. When we got to the top, we saw light in the distance. It was coming from the church, and the singing was coming from inside. Joe and I put our heads close together and had a hushed conversation that boiled down to, can you believe this? The light looked to be a candlelight from the way it flickered, and though we tried, we couldn't make out what was being sung. It sounded like church music, but in another language. We sat and watched for a while, trying to see who was in there, but we only saw occasional shadows. We had no intention of getting closer either. We had about a football field length between us, and we aimed to keep it that way. The singing continued for a bit, and then it stopped. After that, a booming male voice began to chant. I was already freaked out, but this voice thoroughly scared the crap out of me. It sounded like some Old Testament preacher you see in movies, but again, it was like he was speaking in a different language because we couldn't understand a single word. Eventually, it got to where the single male voice would say something, and then a bunch of voices would answer in song. This lasted for a while, and then they all broke into this long, sustained wail that just kept getting louder. It got so loud and so disturbing that I covered my ears. Then it stopped. At this point, I was just getting ready to say, let's get the heck out of here, when Joe put a hand on my shoulder and hissed, they're coming out. We were far enough away that we couldn't really make them out very well, but what we could see was a line of figures walk out the open doorway, all holding hands in single file. We could see some of them had flashlights. They began to sing again, and the light from the flashlights began to move toward us and the hill. We booked it back down to our campsite, grabbed our stuff, and ran to the tracks. Once there, we ran down the tracks in the direction we had come from. After a few minutes, we stopped and looked back. We saw lights coming down the hill, and they were moving erratically like whoever was holding them was shaking them. We continued to run in spurts and walk as fast as we could. We eventually stopped seeing the lights and came to a road. By our map, we knew a small town that was about 15 minutes down it, and we walked there, got to a 24-hour gas station, and called my wife to come get us. My wife and other friends all just thought it was kids messing around, but I heard those voices and they sure as hell didn't sound like any kids to me. Not sure who those people were, but it was definitely the most creepiest thing that happened to me out in the woods. So, this happened about five years ago while I was nine months pregnant. I was Christmas shopping at the mall with my then seven and 15 year old daughters one Saturday night in a very safe city with very low crime rate. There was an Applebee's connected to the mall and we ended our shopping pretty late and the mall stores were starting to close so I took my kids to the connected Applebee's for a late dinner. We finished up eating at about 10 p.m. and leave out the Applebee's entrance into the practically deserted parking lot with shopping bags in tow. As we got to the car, I was in the middle of maneuvering the shopping bags in my arms to find my keys when a 50 ish year old looking guy starts walking up from somewhere in the parking lot with shaggy gray and white hair and a faded flannel shirt and old jeans. I noticed him briskly approaching when he was about 40 feet away and he said, give me all your money now. My blood ran cold and I stared at him owlishly and shakingly said, what? He then said he was just kidding and came up and stood right next to my daughters who were standing on the other side of the car waiting for me to unlock the door to let them in. He then starts making small talk with me and my girls. He's asking things like if they were being good girls for Santa, how old they were, if we got all of our Christmas shopping done, what kind of things did we get, etc. He didn't seem drunk, high, slow, or anything at all. He was very coherent and seemed sound of mind. Mind you, I was a heavily pregnant woman, alone with my two daughters in a mostly deserted parking lot at 10 o'clock at night, I was being approached by a stranger who came and stood right next to my kids on the other side of the car, just shooting the breeze, talking to me and my kids with his hands in his pockets and occasionally looking over his shoulder. I didn't want to aggravate him, so I was politely conversing with him and trying to look calm and nonchalant while trying to disguise my frantic hands digging inside of my giant purse for my car keys. 
This exchange went on for about a couple minutes while he periodically kept looking over his shoulder. I was silently panicking and trying to politely keep the situation from escalating by calmly and nonchalantly talking to him while also trying in vain to find my car keys to get us out of there. They were in there hiding good. I felt that at any moment he was going to pull a knife or gun or rob me and my kids were right next to him, away from their mother on the other side of the car and I couldn't find my car keys to get my kids into the safety of the car. He kept trying to engage them in conversation, and I could see that my oldest daughter was a little weirded out. She kept glancing at me to gauge my assessment and reaction to the situation. Being that he was only talking and acting friendly, and I was doing my best to stay calm, they were oblivious to the alarming situation we were all in. And being 9 months pregnant, and that I was no match for this full grown man, especially if he was hiding a weapon on him. While still desperately digging for my keys, I tried to politely give him hints that the conversation was over by saying things like, It was nice chatting with you, but I gotta get these kids to bed, and It was nice meeting you, and telling my girls to say that it was nice meeting him too. My polite attempts to get this guy to leave wasn't working because he kept sidestepping my attempts and asking them what their favorite school subjects are and how nice young ladies they were, etc. While I was struggling with the shopping bags and digging in my giant cluttered purse for my car keys, my outgoing 7 year old was completely oblivious to how not okay the situation was, because he was being friendly and because of the whole, I'm with mommy so I'm safe child mentality. So she started to talk about what she picked out for dad for Christmas, and started enthusiastically talking about kid stuff and asking him if he knew what Minecraft was, etc. and keeping this creep from leaving us alone by keeping him engaged in conversation. They didn't realize that I was becoming desperate to get them out of there. Then I suddenly felt this sinking feeling of dread when I realized that I may have lost my car keys in the mall, and that we were stuck outside with this strange man who kept looking over his shoulders and was showing no signs of walking away, and I was thinking that he was waiting for the perfect moment to pounce. All he had to do was grab one of my girls and threaten their life, knowing it would make me do whatever he wanted as long as he wouldn't hurt them. I started to feel my adrenaline start to spike, and my heart and stomach started doing flip-flops, and I felt like at any moment something was about to go down, as the gravity of realizing that there were no other people or witnesses around, and that they were totally alone with him at that moment, the odds were stacked against us, and that he has his chance. He all of a sudden was all like, okay, it was nice talking to you, see you later, and walked off in the same direction as which he came. It wasn't until then, I found my car keys and locked the car and told my kids to get in fast and I got in too and locked the doors and started the car and drove out of there. My 15 year old lightheartedly and jokingly said, okay, that was weird, and laughed. I was overwhelmed with relief and then I was confused over what just happened. I thought to myself, why the heck would a guy of seemingly sound mind think it was totally acceptable to go out of his way just to approach a woman and her kids in a deserted parking lot late at night just to chit chat. But being that nothing bad happened, I brushed it off and joked about it too. When we got home, my husband greeted us and asked us how shopping went and I said it went well and my 15 year old told him what happened in the parking lot and how weird it was and was kinda joking about it. I started joking too saying how I was mentally having a panic attack while trying to look calm and I started making fun of myself by telling my husband how I was attempting to inconspicuously rummage through my purse to find my car keys. My husband went completely white and I acknowledged his horrified look of alarm and I assured him that albeit creepy, the guy was talking and eventually left on his own. Now, my father-in-law is a retired sheriff deputy and my husband went through police academy training after graduating high school. He decided to go to business school instead of becoming a cop. And being that the knowledge he gained from that, plus growing up with a cop for my dad, I found out why my husband looked absolutely horrified when I told him about the details. What my husband told me completely rattled me to the bone. My husband told me that he was 100% sure the reason why that guy was hanging around us and chit chatting was because he was waiting for me to unlock my car. And the reason why he was standing next to our kids was because once I unlocked the car and the kids started to get inside, he was most likely going to force himself into the car with the kids and hold a knife or gun to them to gain leverage on me to force me to cooperate, knowing that I wouldn't abandon my kids, which would force me to get into the car with them and then do whatever he wanted me to do, which most likely would be to drive to a remote location to do whatever knows what. And being that he wasn't wearing a mask, suggests that his intentions were to also leave no witnesses to identify him. I then remembered that he was positioned by the backseat passenger door where my 7 year old was, standing by waiting to get in. My husband then told me that the most likely reason why the guy ended up leaving was because it took so long for me to find my keys, and the longer it took, the more anxious and spooked it made him. And that whole time, me trying to search for my car keys in my purse saved me from potentially being abducted. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.